run. Uh, we'll come to order. Uh, this is the October 4th special meeting of the Newport Beach City Council at 7 o'clock. Roll call. The record will show that with the exception of Council Member Selich, all Council Members are present. Okay. We'll, we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance. That's what it says. So please stand. Mr. Nichols, could you give it? There's no invocation. Do you want to give one? Just have one. That's good. We should always start with that. Go ahead. Just give us a sentence. No, we can do it right here. That's fine. Heavenly Father, please guide this uh, council through its deliberations tonight to help set policies that will be in the best interest of the whole community, not only today, but for many, many years to come. Uh, we ask that you uh, bless all of the participants, not only in this meeting, but in this uh, community that you have blessed so greatly. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Who puts us on? Good start. Item number, item number one, general plan update, review draft goals and policies for the historical resources element. This, this is... Uh, should we go over this uh, revised schedule first? We can do it first. Or Why don't we do that? Whichever you prefer. Why don't we do it first? Why don't you explain what this is to kind of give our give our residents a little idea of how involved this general plan process is? We um, are working on the environmental impact report now because the the last study session the council had you gave us direction on which land use alternatives to include in that. So while that work is being done, we are reviewing the policies the, that will be in the various elements of the general plan. This is the, the beginning of that process, which will go on for quite a few meetings. Um, today we are covering historic resources, arts and cultural, and public safety. On October 18th, we'll be reviewing recreation and open space and conservation and natural resources. In November, we'll have two meetings dealing with land use issues uh, and also the harbor and, and bay element that exists now that we're probably incorporating into the land use element. And those will be on November 15th and November 29th. Uh, on December 6th, we'll be reviewing circulation and mobility. And by that time, we'll have the results of the traffic model run of the um, land use plan you selected for study in the EIR. Um, January 17th, the economic strategic plan. January 31st, um, the noise element, housing element, and growth management element. And February 7th, uh, implementation programs. Uh, and then beginning in uh, April, um, we'll have um, public hearings on the draft environmental impact report and the general plan, and we've got four hearings scheduled, um, ending up with um, June 8th um, and June 26th for certification of the EIR and adoption of the new general plan. And by the way, for all of these dates I've mentioned, on the different elements of the general plan. Um, the Planning Commission is meeting in the afternoon to review the same material that the uh, City Council is reviewing in the evening. And before all of these policies come to the Planning Commission and the City Council, we're taking to them to the General Plan Advisory Committee first, and we had a meeting on Saturday to discuss the items that are on your agenda this evening. Sharon, will EQAC look at this at all? EQAC I mean will review the draft EIR. So, so the draft DIR is what do you call that? That will be generated at what relative time here? That'll be April. Okay. Now that April generation, usually part of EQAC's report is also to generate some uh, questions. That's going to be disallowed or something. They're being generated by the different committees or no, by e staff or No, e EQAC will review the draft EIR like they do with all EIRs the city does. So in April, uh, then they will generate or could generate questions that would still have to go back out 
for answers, you're saying? They, they will, I'm sure, have comments on the draft EIR, as they do on any draft EIR, that I would think if the draft EIR is released in April, it would probably be the May meeting of EQAC where they will discuss that. And then staff and the consultants will respond to their comments, like we always do for EIRs. And then when the final EIR is presented to the Planning Commission and the City Council for certification, it will include their comments, comments we've reviewed, received from others, and all of the responses to those comments. The, the same procedure as always for an EIR. I just wondered because it looked like there was so much planning going into what's in the EIR, whether it would be better to have those comments earlier. I'm, uh, well, they can't comment until they see the draft EIR. Well, I, I sort of gather that, but usually they had something to do with what the question's being answered on it. And here you're going to have a, I mean, you're going out to generate an EIR independent of the oh, are you referring to the EQAC reviewing the notice of preparation of the EIR? Yeah, that they will do that too. We'll follow our standard procedures. Okay, so sometime fairly soon that would be coming to them for just a review of what we're looking at. Of, of what issues we'll be studying in the EIR, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry, <coughs> I, I wasn't trying to be confusing. But I, seems like I did okay. <laughs> Yes, Councilman Bailey. Uh, are these dates mentioned, or are these regularly scheduled council meetings, or are these special meetings? Uh, the ones that are shown with asterisks are special meetings. So oh, okay. the ones um, November yeah, through February list. are. And, and the special meeting dates are generally the, the alternate Tuesday. Okay, so those are eight special meetings. What opportunities might exist to either fold those on to existing city council meetings or to consolidate some of those meetings? I think with the amount of material there is to cover, it will be difficult to, to fold it into a council meeting unless we were to know in advance that you're going to have a very short agenda. Um, the Planning Commission spent two and a half hours this afternoon on these issues. Okay. Just as an example, like the 4th and the 18th dates, I mean, let's say we're here for two hours this evening. I mean, w why not have had those, all of that this evening? Well, because the next group isn't ready yet, and GPAC hasn't reviewed them yet. I suppose we could have canceled this meeting and put them all on the 18th, but that would have made for a very long night on the 18th. And also because the Planning Commission is meeting on the same day, then if they were reviewing all that material at once, they would have needed to start early in the afternoon, which is probably difficult for those who work. Right. I guess my preference would be for longer and less meetings. I mean, since we're going to one in the morning anyway for a lot of these meetings, and then to have a lot of <coughs> uh, shorter meetings. Mr. Sellett, you have a comment on that since you've done this before? Well, I would, um, I would, uh, you know, agree that the more we can combine these, the you know, the better off uh, we are. I've kind of left it, my own way of thinking, up to the staff to uh, figure out how to do it. But I'm, you know, I'm all for less meetings. I mean, the other thing we could do is maybe look at scheduling some of these um, at, at our normal study sessions time, some of the ones that would be shorter, so we don't have to have a special meeting and not have other items on the study session. That, that could be one thing that could be done. Some of the things that would be shorter. Wouldn't, uh, not the major things like land use or circulation, because I think we'll be into a lot of discussion on those. But but I had I had a question for Sharon. Sure. Could you could, could you explain to to us? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it again. When when are we going to start making real decisions on land use and circulation? Those are the the heart of the general plan, and the thing that most people are interested as important as these other elements and policies are, I think that's where a lot of the interest lies. And when when are we going to start making decisions on it, really getting back into those areas? And I, in um, November, when we're reviewing the, the land use element, and, and we've scheduled two meetings for that. In fact, this afternoon the Planning Commission thought that um, they might want to um, have some land use discussions um, also carry over into some of their regular meetings. Um, 
for November 15th and, and 29th, you'll be seeing not just the, the quantities of land use that we've been talking about so far, but also the draft policies as, as you're seeing for the topics on tonight's agenda. So it's, it's the first opportunity to, to talk about what kind of uh, place making we're talking about creating in the airport area or Newport Center if we're introducing more mixed use and for the Planning Commission and the Council to talk more in depth about what we really want these areas to become, to what extent do we want to introduce residential in those areas, um, if it's going to have um, this set of policies for locational criteria and design guidelines, then does that make it more acceptable to, to have a greater number of units? Does that maybe change your thinking as to where the residential should be allowed? So I, I think that it, um, if we try to start out at those two meetings with doing the four areas in the city that I think have the most land use issues, uh, those being the airport area, um, Newport Center, Fashion Island, Mariner's Mile, and Banning Ranch, that um, you'll be able to have a, a very good in-depth discussion um, and then perhaps leave some of the smaller areas for the end of those meetings or um, on a regular agenda of yours, which is the way the Planning Commission intends to approach it. Um, and at that point, you won't have the, the latest run of the traffic model but we do have the traffic information from the alternatives analysis. And so you still have, have a fair amount of information on traffic and fiscal impact that I think can help you in those discussions. And then following right on that will be the de December 6th meeting when we will have the, the new information on traffic and that will help you perhaps do some refinements on land use. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Well, so what did, we, what did we decide on meetings? Same schedule, fewer of them. Do I get to make the decisions tonight again? Anything you want, that's a good seat to start from. Go ahead. Well, I would prefer to see some of these shorter items that aren't going to take a lot of time go on a, go on a study session schedule. The ones that are going to take a long time, like uh, land use, I don't think we can handle them in that format, but the other ones I think can be done in a study session. Well, does that mean just the two that we're facing, like tonight and uh, on the 18th? Well, the economic strategic plan, that might be able to be done. Um, Policy, noise, housing, growth, that might be a, a, a study session. I, I kind of have to rely on staff on this a little bit. Implementation, that might be another one that might be a study session uh, agenda item. May I suggest that, that we hold this decision and, and see how it goes this evening and, and see how much time it takes so you can get a better feel for how much time you need to go through these elements and the policies? Well then, let me get, let me let's work backwards. What was your best guess? How long the planning commission was going to take before you had that meeting? How long do you think they, they were going to take? Two and a half hours. And so they were right on target. Yes. So how long do you think we're going to take tonight? Two hours. All right. Good. There's an estimate. Good. Great. It's playoff time. You're take well, take see, that the line. Perfect into a study right. session format. It's two two and a half right. hours. Yeah. Well, well yeah. other items that we ask the staff to provide for. Well, us. that's the trade off. That's the trade off. Yeah. We need to give them a break someplace as far as uh, adding additional work. Uh, I'll make a pact with council that I won't ask for anything more on study sessions if you won't. We have quite a lineup already as far as study yes, sessions, yes. but we, we, if you're willing to meet maybe at 3.30, start study sessions at 3.30 instead of 4 so that we can get at least a... 30 minute or 45 minute I item in, I, I think that's very doable. Of course, we can't have the kind of meeting you're having tonight and call it a study session. It would have to be a continuation of one of these special meetings because you can't make any decisions and really give any direction unless it's it's in a meeting. All right, how's that sound? Yeah, I think that's good to put try to put them into the study session. I know on November 15th, I simply can't make that meeting and we request that we not hold it. It is on land use. And, We're uh, looking at having a meeting every week for the next nine weeks, it sounds like, and okay. that's a very Well, the problem schedule. with the 15th, I signed up for the Chamber of Commerce tour to China, so I won't be in town. Well, I mean, this thing, we can't miss the ballot. I mean, and I've told, and I've told staff that's the target. If we get down into July because we fudge something and we don't make the ballot language, then we're going to be in a peculiar color. 
That, that, that is the other concern that, that we may impact the schedule. And, and the, the really critical ones for the schedule are land use and circulation. When, when, I, when is that event that you're going to um, leaving? The 9th. And I deliberately scheduled it between council meetings, or they did, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, there's nothing to say that we have to stick to Tuesday meetings either. I mean, right. we could have other days of the week or, I mean, to help accommodate Councilwoman Daigle's plans. You. Well, I mean, the problem is we're going to meet nice on the to break it up a little. <laughs> She's leaving on the 9th. We're meeting on the 22nd. When are you going to be back? Uh, I think on the 19th. Well, I mean, Where unless we? we're and then that's Thanksgiving week, the 24th. We're going to start stacking meetings up. Either we're going to meet on the 8th. You leave on the 9th. Either right. we're going to meet on the 22nd and the 23rd, which is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I'll be Thanksgiving. back on the 16th, so we could do it. Let's say the uh, 17th. You're here, you're back on the 16th. I think I will have to check. Well, well we don't or why not have just tonight. one really long land use meeting? No, this is very intense. I mean, I, I would suggest that. Yeah, right. You need, you need to. <clears throat> and we'll probably have some people um, in the seats too, yeah. wanting to give input. So, anyhow. Just a question: Is there any way we can arrange this so we can find out what happened at the planning uh, commission? I think it's important, and I think that we have good people on that. We don't have any idea how they're deciding or what they're deciding, you know, on the two hours or two and a half hours before this. And then we basically are making decisions based on what's happening without any – I mean, we had a, a scheduled website meeting, for example, for three of us, so it, it, it isn't even possible to go sit in on that. Well, we'll be reviewing – what both the General Plan Advisory Committee did on Saturday and what the Planning Commission did this afternoon as we go through each of these with you. You know, originally the schedule showed that there were going to be joint meetings of the Planning Commission and the City Council, and that was the wish of the Planning Commission and the City Council. Uh, and we held a couple of those study sessions, and they were not satisfactory, and so then we decided to hold them separately. Um, and given where we are in the schedule, this may be the best we can do other than, than adding them to some afternoon study sessions if you're willing to delay right. some of the other All matters right. you've so, asked for. Councilman Dago, you get your schedule, get it to staff, but it is, we're going to have to have two full-blown November meetings on top of two full-blown council meetings in November. So somehow we're going to wedge them in and uh, we'll just see what we can do because we have to have them. I don't think we can postpone that. That's too important of a of an item. We're not oh, going to push that into October. If we postpone land use, then the schedule will be kaput. Right. All right. Well, I'll definitely work with them on that component. It seems like Councilman Sellers and Councilman Ridgway are both saying where there's opportunity to put these onto the study session. But those are not study session items. And those, those aren't, but some of these others, as he mentioned, might Sure, be. sure. We'll do that. Maybe you could uh, video stream from China. <laughs> <laughs> There's only 12 hours difference, so instead of sleeping, you can be at the meeting. Right. Well, if these meetings run late enough, it'll be just mid-morning. It's <laughs> good. All right. We can do it by telephone. You could teleconference in and... Post a notice on your door in China. We'll have to have it translated, though. I'll be on the Great Wall while watching this. <laughs> okay. I think we can jump. Any other any other comments on schedule? Okay. Sharon. Okay, well, as we started to say, this is the beginning of the review of the policies and the the general plan elements themselves. Um, we will. Uh, well, well, first, Woody Tesher is going to, to do some general discussion on what goals and policies are and, and how the, the state planning guidelines direct us to write those things. And then we will go through element by element and goal by goal um, and update you as to what uh, changes the General Plan Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission recommended to what was in your packet. And you do have... Um, a package with a cover memo from Greg Ramirez that has a red line um, showing you what changes GPAC recommended on Saturday. With that, Mr. Tesh. Okay. With that, Mayor and members of the Council, uh, again reminding you we're looking at three elements tonight, historic resources, arts and cultural, and public safety. 
Uh, as we begin this, I just want to reiterate for us, as you will find in this section, beyond the background information, you will find that the content of the plan is really organized at two levels. One is a statement of an overarching goal for which there is at least one, but in most cases multiple policies identified for each of those goals. And as we will go through here the presentation tonight and, and for the discussion of the Council, what we'll do is not regurgitate every one of the policies policy by policy, but we'll focus on each goal by itself and then have you talk about the policies uh, without uh, reiterating them. But first let me go back to the state definition of what a, a goal is. Uh, and, and because all of us in our own businesses sometimes have goal setting and there are certain definitions to what is a goal. And in some cases what the state planning law differs, at least what we do in our own business environment, as to how we define goals. The state for general plan purpose indicates that a goal in a general plan is a general direction setter. Uh, it's, it, it is really a statement about what the future at the end state will be uh, regarding the basic topics of health, safety, and general welfare of, of the community. It's intended to be a general expression of community values, and inherently it may be abstract. I know many of us, when we set goals, we quantify goals, and state law says specifically in general plans that goals are not necessarily quantifiable or time dependent. Really, they're again the statement of what one achieves at the end of, of the action and the implementation of all the correlated policies. A quick example, and I'm going to put all three of these up here. Um, <clears throat> if, if this were a general uh, goal about the nature of residential streets in the community, the first statement is not considered a goal under state law in that it is an action oriented. It says you're going to do something, you're going to establish. So that is not considered the goal, nor is it to, to establish. That's not a statement about the end state, but the end state is to have quiet residential streets. And you will see that in the document you have in front of you, in the GPAC version, there's some mixing of this. So we, we beg the council's uh, um, consideration here because we're going to go to need to revise some of these goals based upon the fact we mixed uh, some both direction as well as end states into these basic goals. So what we're really looking for here tonight is whether the basic theme, if you will, of the goal statement uh, indeed is an accurate reflection as well. Policy at the next level down, though, is indeed, and all the policies are intended to be the roadmap of action orientations by which you achieve that particular goal. It's intended to indicate also that you are committed as a legislative body to see that that particular policy is carried through to the point that indeed the state guidelines and general plan suggest the use of mandatory language. And they specifically in the general plan guidelines differentiate between the terms, for example, on shall and should. And in the interpretation, and this has also been uh, upheld in a number of court cases, shall indicates an unequivocal directive. And indeed, the state guidelines suggest that in general plans that the terminology used is require and shall unless the city council has no formal way to make sure it's going to occur. For example, I used this example earlier, and it's kind of a silly example, but if you had a policy about have a nice day, well, I'm not sure the city council could actually make sure that that's achievable by every person in the community. But where you do have the ability to effectuate the implementation of that policy, the suggestion is indeed to use the terminology shall. In fact, the terminology is should or encourage is intended to be a less rigid directive in, in its use and is interpreted to say that way. And if a general plan is, uh, uses the term should to imply commitment of a city jurisdictional agency to carry that out, uh, it's considered an unacceptable uh, practice and it's considered not to be an appropriate policy of the general plan. In fact, the guidelines suggest using no policy or no policies to address that if you indeed cannot find a way to, to carry it through. So that is background. Let me jump into the elements. Uh, as I said, we have three elements. Uh, the first of those is the historic resources. Back early, you know, probably a couple years ago, it seems a century ago now, when we talked about the content of the general plan, if you recall, we said that there are certain topics that must be addressed by general plan. But this state also allows a city to create additional policy regarding topics of special concern to the city itself. 
and then the developing of the program uh, and the work program for this general plan update, the city uh, directed and decided that one of those elements that's not required but they wanted some policy regarding is historic resources. So this is considered an optional element. I should also counsel you that the uh, adoption of any optional element, once adopted, even though it's not required, once you adopt it, it holds equal weight under law to all of the other mandated elements. So for example, if you proceed forward with policies on historic resources or any other optional element, once you adopt those, you can't say, well, that was not required as an element of the general plan, so we're not going to implement that to a lesser level or adhere to that to a lesser extent than we would say another element that is required like circulation. So it holds equal weight under law and cannot be held to be an inferior document uh, itself. The historic elements intended to indeed f sort of focus on, on a number of key components. One is the recognition of the unique resources within the city of, of uh, Newport Beach and secondarily is to look at the ways and the strategies on which those resources can be protected. So again, I'll just briefly address each of the goal, and what I'm suggesting is what I'll do is talk about each goal individually and then stop my presentation to have the council uh, review and deliberate the appropriate policies for that particular goal itself. And we'll summarize for you what the uh, advisory committee and the planning commission did in respect to each of these. The first goal is a policy that talks about the protection or the goal addresses broadly about the recognition that there are significant landmark sites and structures out there and that there indeed be strategies to protect those structures, landmarks, and sites. And then there are a series of policies dealing with inventory, uh, potential preservation of reuse, landmark status and how landmarks are identified, reuse of structures, and then how to incorporate uh, historical elements uh, in, in new projects, which are the basic topics. Um, in the document, um, uh, in fact, what I'll do is defer to Sharon, because I did not attend the GPAC meeting to sort of indicate for you in the document we have presented to you the red language, the uh, underline and the strikeout language were changes made by the advisory committee, and Sharon can and suggest how the original text was modified by the GPAC, and then we can indicate to you what the council uh, commission did this afternoon. The, the GPAC... Um added a new policy, H1.1, um, and that was to create and periodically update a historical resources preservation master plan um, that would create historic districts, create and maintain a historic resources inventory, identifies historical landmarks, encourages adaptive reuse, and incorporates historic elements within new projects. Um, the and then in a couple of the other policies, there was reference to this master plan. The Planning Commission did not agree with the master plan approach. Um, they thought that it was um, putting too much of a requirement on the city, uh, might result in um, the need for more bureaucracy, more staff people. Uh, and they went back to the original language as uh, recommended by staff and the consultant, which is to maintain and periodically update the Newport Beach Register of Historical Property for buildings, objects, structures, and monuments having importance to the history or architecture of Newport Beach, and then to delete the references to a master plan in the following policies. They made one additional change, and that was on policy uh, H. Point. It was originally H.1.2, became 3, and back to 2. It's the, the, the policy addressing the preservation or reuse of historic structures they suggested the language that the GPAC had recommended, which was really reversing the language. The original language indicated discourage the demolition, and the commission suggested that they encourage the preservation. So the reverse lens, if you will, of that particular policy was their recommendation. So that was the one suggestion from the GPAC they accepted. So we hand it back to the council for discussion. Okay, where do we start? Mr. Start. Selich? Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't seen the idea um, just till just now on creating this historical resource preservation master plan, but I think I would tend to agree with the Planning Commission just pretty much for the reasons that, that, that Sharon outlined. I, as it was being presented, I was trying to think of where we would set up historical resources preservation districts in the city, and I really can't think of anywhere that there's enough cohesiveness to do that. 
Yeah, um, I, I would echo the same comment. Actually, I do have a copy of the document that was prepared. Uh, I think 1992, there was an ad hoc committee to establish buildings that had significant value, but there was never any formal action taken. But when you review that document, which is a photo um, anthology or a photo album of buildings, there really are no districts and uh, the only area I could think of that would qualify would be McFadden Square, and at that point, I really don't think it qualifies. So I wouldn't encourage a master plan. I think we are more, uh, because of the, the age and size of our city, or our, our individual parcels, we're, we're really kind of limited to parcels and not to a master plan. Um, I, I think it also could be used, if we went to a master plan concept, it could be used to thwart otherwise good development, and I don't think that's what we want to encourage here. Preservation, yes, I do like the reverse lens, by the way. So encourage the preservation of existing buildings. The council should understand that policy H1.1, which says maintain and periodically update this register, is something that we have not been doing. And no, uh, At the moment, we do not have staff resources for. Uh, so that, as well as policy 1.4 and 1.5 with regard to adaptive reuse and uh, historical elements within new projects are, are going further in the area of historic preservation than we have gone before. So this, this really is new policy territory and definitely a policy decision to be made by the City Council. Sharon, or Mr. Mayor, I, I'd make one comment. The book that was prepared in, again, I, I want to say it was 1992, is uh, pretty comprehensive. I mean, nothing has really changed in our city to change that specific inventory of buildings. Um, they pretty well found them all. So the fact that you've done nothing in that period of time, I don't think impairs the uh, quality of the underlying document that currently exists. I, I, again, it was, it, it's very easy to, especially with the group that assembled that, to identify all our historical or potential historical buildings. Uh, I, I can't think of one um, that should be added. So your, your, your staff time is saved. Well, Mr. Webb, um, I think that <clears throat> it probably is not a terribly uh, difficult task because history is really the older buildings and so we're, they're not going to change in much more than being torn down probably. The Centennial uh, Committee, the Heritage Committee that Gay Kelly is heading up is, is uh, going through the process of, of looking at e the ex city's existing historical markers and we'll be making recommendations through the centennial process this year of adding a few more which ties in to historical landmarks policy down below. Um, I think that uh, um, I don't think we have a real problem of peri periodically updating something if it gets done every five years or even every ten years. I don't see that that's going to be a tremendous amount of time. I, I agree with Councilman Ridgeway that uh, the list was fairly comprehensive. I haven't gone through it real recently, but I think that the, the Heritage Committee also will uh, be looking at that list and make some recommendations, and, and maybe that's one of the committees that can we can have some volunteer committees and, and maybe work with the Newport Beach Historical Society in, in implementing a number of these things rather than having the staff do it. Um, I know that we're just going over the goals and policies, but in the narrative which talks about the history of Newport, uh, I'd like to have the Heritage Committee also go through that with the city staff because I think there are a number of places where the history that has been written uh, has uh, some not quite inaccuracies, but uh, I think could be improved in its wording and so that I would like to see the Heritage Committee as one of its tasks uh, uh, in the next six months uh, try to help the staff out and review that uh, historical discussion that uh, 
uh, precedes the goals and policies because I think that uh, the his history that is shown in there uh, kind of stops about 50 years ago and it might be nice to also add a little bit of the more recent history since this document is probably not going to be modified again for another 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I, I, actually I, I kind of felt the same way They and some of the dates seemed a little off. There were big gaps in there in this his, historical perspective. And um, just for a historical perspective, um, I think it deserves mention. And I, Patty, the Newport Tomorrow document, what year was that created? 1972-69. And what it did was establish a roadmap, a, a policy roadmap for then an undeveloped community. And I really think you should mention that in the historical perspective because that really carried us up right about to 1990. And then 1990 on is when we started. We hit build out and then we hit tension. <laughs> we kind of hit the wall. But I think it's worth mentioning that document because the people who were involved in that, that Newport uh, Tomorrow document uh, were, it was kind of a, they were the history of this community, the, the newer history, I should say. No, you don't have to. I'm just suggesting. My comment is, is uh, we have uh, sat by and watched uh, some of the historic houses and so forth uh, be demolished uh, to avoid the historic uh, setting. And, uh, and I'm questioning whether we uh, should... Uh, put such a, a document, I mean, uh, make such a determination without the uh, blessing or the, the approval of the landowner, because basically uh, we have uh, gone along with landowners that have recently and in the near past uh, done away with uh, particular houses and so forth to avoid any historic uh, setting and that's been allowed <laughs> to happen um, and and I'm not saying that's not right but I, I think in the same sense we should not be determining somebody's got a historic uh, building or so forth without their blessing I but, think uh, but actually we, we have two things now we have an inventory which is the document the council member Ridgeway has been speaking of and that is sort of a candidate list of historic structures and sites. And then there is a register um, which is governed by city council policy and that has many fewer, some five or six sites on it. And city attorney is checking, but I believe that, that the council cannot add something to the register which gives it a more official status unless the property owner applies or requests it. But Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Ridgway. Uh, I'm going to bring up a, a slippery slope for council. And that is um, this city, all citizens believe in real property rights. And you're getting to the economic value of properties. So I, I'll use an example, maybe not a good one, but it's, it's probably one that will play out here in the future, and that's the Lovell House at the corner of um, 13th and Ocean Front. And I suspect the land value is far, far exceeds its current value on the open marketplace, and yet it is a significant landmark house. It's not registered. So do we want to get into a discussion within our document <laughs> about either, you know, I don't want to go to the word subsidy, but perhaps, you know, if, if, if these things get into, and again, that's a problem you face with a beach community, an oceanfront community, some of these things, we're going to constrain value significantly. Not, yeah, that, that particular house is on the National Register. Yeah, I believe... Um, 
They put it on there, probably. I think the owner did. But there are other houses that don't quite fit that definition. But I, again, if you know, if we or not we, and it wouldn't be council. This is kind of interesting. I don't think it's council who puts these things on a register. It is. It is council. Well, Pardon me. It is the council. Okay, that, that would be the city's to... historical register. Yes. But I think that if you look into the National Register, that's an extremely uh, uh, difficult process, and the property owner or the city have to make significant applications, fill out forms, justifications, and it doesn't <coughs> just happen. That's, that's a long process. I can't envision probably any the city really pushing for anything on the National Register other than the pavilion building. And uh, uh, as far as Newport is concerned, uh, but I think that we may would there may be a number of buildings that would have citywide significance rather than national or states. Like I think there are only right. three, four, I guess, uh, California registered landmarks within the city right now. And uh, seven. Um, okay, I'll. Oh, I'm sorry. Four, I, I four said are California. Landmarks. Four are landmarks. The others are just listed. Right. Okay. There are four landmarks, and, and we have uh, disappeared one of the plaques for one of those landmarks uh, during our Balboa Pier work. But at any rate, I think that, that uh, this is, as far as, as registering the buildings and, and it just doesn't happen unless the property owner really pushes for it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Don. I, I, I'm just saying as a council, if we want to encourage, and I do agree with you, most of these are local historical value, not national, except for the pavilion and perhaps a, you know, the landmark areas where Eddie Martin took off and the, the wharf and that type of thing. But... Um, it, Per, perhaps by by process, we will not be in a a position to constrain values. But I just suggest it's it, it looms out there as a, a a possible issue. Okay, one of the things that happened, uh, I don't know if you remember the the barns down at uh, uh, Ford Road and in MacArthur Boulevard. When the Irvine Company demolished those uh, uh, facilities uh, that was in the city of Irvine at the time, and the Irvine Historical Society uh, got the city council to place a uh, requirement on the Irvine Company to do really two things. One, before the buildings were removed, that they do a uh, historical photographic survey of the entire site as well as uh, a, a no, it was a survey it was more than photographs. It ended up doing uh, uh, plot plans of all the buildings and that type of thing to where you can see where the buildings were. I guess there were three items to that. Uh, the, the second item was that they uh, required that the barn be donated to the, the county, which ultimately it was sold and to uh, uh, Dennis, uh, yeah. uh, whatever, the built the boat. And he's now built, rebuilt the barn. But then the third item was that they mark the site with uh, some sort of historical marker that would uh, describe the significance of, of what was there. And that's why we got the buffalo, the big bronze buffalo that you drive by all the time, as well as a, a plaque that uh, describes the history. So it would seem like to me that, that I believe this, that's sort of the direction that this policy is going. Uh, like, for instance, the house one of the original houses in Corona Del Mar that's on Ocean Boulevard is still standing. Now the house next door was torn down and I don't believe that the, the city or anybody really uh, recognized and photographed or, or took, uh, uh, created any significant uh, mention of that house being gone and I think that the house that's there today, which is probably one of the oldest houses in Corona Del Mar, uh, if it were to be torn down tomorrow, uh, I don't think we have any policies that, unless we adopt something like this, that would uh, at least cause us to document what was there. And I think that that's the, more the direction that we should be going rather than perhaps trying to require preservation if we can get some sort of significant documentation that can record the building, like for instance the old hotel. 
that uh, was torn down for the condos on Carnation. Uh, would have been nice to have a, a historic photographic survey of that uh, so that we can see what was but not necessarily require it to stay. Yeah, I, I think historic documentation is not quite in this document, but I think that's good direction for staff to perhaps in the, create that. Well, again, we, we have the inventory, which affords the property no protection whatsoever. It's purely information. And then we have a register that has five sites on it, which I think would afford a property some protection or at least environmental review if someone proposed to demolish or change those buildings because the city has said these are important to the city's history. So is the council suggesting that for everything on the inventory, we go in the direction of identifying and landmarking if they're torn down, doing photographic surveys. Do we want to review the inventory to see what really is significant and perhaps should be added to the register and treat those differently? <coughs> Mr. Selich? <coughs> Yeah, I, you know, I think we kind of ought to, ought to stick within the context that we have. I think you can explore some of those things, but to uh, go in beyond what we have, I think, uh, as Councilmember Ridgeway stated, is you get started on it, you start get it on a, get start going down a slippery slope. Um, I kind of had a comment on a little different vein on this, and something that staff brought up earlier that there's a number of things in here that we're not doing now and they're going to uh, take additional staff resources to uh, handle if we adopt it. And what I would like to see before we make our final decision on this general plan uh, sometime next year, that we have staff go through and quantify what it's going to take in terms of staff time to do this, because I, I suspect that as we go through some of these other elements, they're going to be presenting us other policies and programs that are going to be requiring additional staff time. And, I think in the end, before we adopt the general plan, we're going to want to sit and take a look at each of the elements and the new programs we're talking about um, implementing and determining whether the, there's a, you know, there's a uh, cost benefit uh, that's acceptable to us to be taking on additional responsibilities that we're not doing now, particularly things that are not mandatory elements. And uh, so I, I think in order for us to make the decision, we ought to have that information in front of us. Uh, Ms. Rayer, I concur with the Planning Commission, also Councilman Webb and Ridgeway, to not include the master plan. And I think what I would hold out to Councilman Webb is that we do have a council policy. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but I know when I uh, did some intensive research on our finance policy L2 um, for last um, hearing that there are opportunities to change the council policy. I think when you look at the, the general plan and the goals and the policies, um, you know, we've been sued on our housing element in the past, and I don't take lightly putting in new policies that we really aren't going to be able to meet and don't intend to meet. So I would say that there's other oppor opportunities within our framework to look at uh, historical types of properties and how we document them. Okay. Mr. Nichols? Yeah, I, uh, it's been brought up, and I would um, definitely say that um, we are not enforcing any of this right now, and I, I certainly don't think any house or facility should be transferred into uh, this district unless um, it's with full recognition of the party. Uh, the China House was one that nobody's mentioned, and it certainly had a controversy when it was torn down. Uh, the first house in Corona del Mar just recently went down. I mean, and it went down in a heck of a hurry to make sure that nobody put any historical significance on it. And uh, the Irvine Hotel was the same thing. It was, it was uh, trashed in a hurry when they decided to do it so that it wouldn't be made historical. So. We're not uh, uh, stepping up to try and do this now, and I, I really don't think we should do it without the blessing of the owner in the future. Be, it would be, um, it, I think it would be a step beyond what we 
what uh, we're doing. And, and I think it would be a disservice to those that we haven't acted on before. The Frank Lloyd Wright building there in, in uh, Newport, in uh, along Coast Highway in, at Heliotrope is the same thing. That's a specially designed commercial building that uh, has historical significance. That was done by his son. It still has considerable historical significance. But in, in policy H, H1.2, where you talk about preservation or re reuse of historical structures, it seems like to me that that would be the spot where we could require, if the property is being demolished, a, a, a photo study documentation of what was being demolished with some sort of marker placed on the site to recognize its, its demise. Yeah. Uh, I, I would envision that as a result of the centennial uh, work that we're doing that the list of city <coughs> historical resources that we have shown at seven may grow to 40 or 50 by the time uh, we end up uh, making some recommendations. So, uh, but as far as preservation or reuse of historical structures are concerned, I think we need to allow for the Photo, the photo, pres photo preservation is a, a great way to go. So uh, with that direction, I, I think we beat this up pretty good. Unfortunately, I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> Would you like yeah. me to bring one in? <laughs> but you have to identify. You mean the 1992 book? You would right. need to no, do that. the policies. Are, are, are we keeping 1.4 and 1.5, which talk about adaptive reuse and historical elements within new projects, or are we merely expanding H1.2 to require photographic records when it, an historic structure is demolished? 1.3. Well, I, you know, Sharon uh, and Mr. Mayor, I want to state. I, 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 if we're going to wordsmith this document, that's not what we're here for tonight. I'm not asking for wordsmith. I'm just asking for what's in and what's out. Okay. Well, the master plan is clearly out. Yeah. 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 It seems to me that the, the master plan's out in 1.2, put in a statement for photo documentation. And that's it. And, okay. and as far as and what's going to be documented, you have your existing list, and it sounds like through the Centennial Committee that there's going to be some additional candidates submitted up to... I think, I think, so. think 1.1 needs to stay. Uh, 1.3 needs to stay, too. Okay. 1.4? Can I ask for a clarification when the Centennial Committee submits this list of 40 or so properties, who then makes the call that, that the they are, who sanctions them? City Council. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I might ask, in light of the conversation, what I'm hearing, the, the city already has a document that identifies landmarks and that can be updated. And the council also has a council policy that processes information with regards to historical pros, uh, properties and has uh, authorizes property owners to be able to be on a um, to to apply to have their um, properties identified in the city's documents. This has already been identified for the council as a optional element. So if the council does not think that this particular issue rises to the um, importance of being an additional uh, required element or a um, now part of the general plan, um, then you might want to talk about that as, a, as an initial question of whether you even want to include this. Because you don't have to. And one thing I might point out is that as um, Woody point, said that once it's adopted and becomes part of the general plan, it doesn't become a lesser element. It has the same mandate and importance as all the others, which means you can't have conflicts between them. Also means that when in the future the council makes a finding or makes some sort of an analysis of some sort of a project or something and whether it complies with the general plan or whether it's consistent with the general plan, this element would be involved in that. Um, environmental documents review and issues with regarding the general plan, then this element and the provisions and the policies would be part of that as well. So there's some significance to a decision to add that this element to your general plan. And if it's important um, to this council that a historical um, element be added, then 
it's worth going through this, but if you'd rather deal with it more as a zoning or a land use or a policy issue on a different level, then you might not even want to add this. Let me ask you a question to the plan. Did you address that specific question in the Planning Commission? No, we didn't. Could not. Then where did this all come from? Where where, where all this time um, and effort? Because that, that's a very preliminary question before we spent, seems like, hours and hours to get to this point. When, when the uh, general plan update committee made its recommendations for the scope of the general plan update, which was then included in the contract for EIP that the city council approved, the historic element was part of that. And so we have taken that direction and been working on it. So an option would be to put the kibosh on the whole thing and not yes. make this part of the general plan at all. Yes. Because we have an existing council policy that deals with it. Even if you didn't, you don't need to deal with it. Well, I understand, general. but the fact is it's not going to, we're not going to zero. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and, and these issues that are being discussed here could be discussed in an update of the, of the his, um, council policy. And does this have less lesser weight because it's not in the general plan because it's in a council policy? Council when yes. some mm -hmm. Council policies only have administrative weight as it gives direction for um, the city um, employees and city staff as to how to implement um, city properties or um, the city's historical register, I think we call it now. Okay, but Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I'm going to make probably an unpopular comment, but way back in the beginning when we started this process, I do know there were people who wanted to get into historical policy in order to prevent the mansionization of Corona del Mar. It was being used as a tool then um, to keep the tiny little shacks in and around town. I'm just putting that out there for your for discussion. Um, we, we've come a long way from that initial discussion, number one, and uh, number two, I, I think we have adequate protections for those uh, older buildings and, and landmark areas already within our framework that, that they're adequately protected. So there was a reason why it was originally uh, suggested, and I, I think we've far surpassed that at this point in time. All right, but let me get this. Would you be for or against adding this as part of the general plan? Because I think our other buildings are adequately protected, I, I, I see no reason. All right, so you're a no. Okay, let's have everybody else weigh in on this. Uh, Councilman Daigle? Uh, no on optional. So you don't want it as part of the general plan? No, I, th I think we have a council policy. Take, for example, our finances are guided by a council policy. We seem to be doing pretty well. Okay, good. Mr. Nichols? I'd be for excluding it. Well, there's four right there. Well, I'm just. Um, it, well, it's always happened. been a it's always been a close call for me on it, and that's why I asked for, you know, identifying how much it's going to cost because I suspect that, uh, you know, it might end up being. So, are you for it or not? Uh, I'm for ex excluding it. All right, that's five. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? I'll agree that it's probably covered in other areas and that's redundant and to the extent that we can streamline our plan and not create opportunities for objections to the plan, maybe we should just leave it out. All right, Mr. Webb, you're last. I'm into history, so I'd like to see us have some sort of element, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, we've quite gotten what we need to have here, so that uh, with that in mind, I think we can always add it later on if we want to. Okay. Is that enough direction for you? <laughs> that's pretty close. That's good. Okay. I mean, I don't want to seven oh is all this way through, but if that's fine, that's fine. Okay. We still are going to, uh, as far as our council policies, are going to update them through the, uh, through the throughout this rest of this year. And so, Gay, you still have plenty of work to do. Okay. Let me ask uh, City Manager, when do we take do we take public comment one by one, public comment at the end? How do you, how have we done this? I think one by one. One by one? Are we at the point of one by one? Okay. Let's. Anybody want to talk on this topic? Public public comment is open. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dee Wassel Kelly, and uh, I am chair of the let's see subcommittee for the Centennial Heritage, and um, I didn't understand 
all that was happening here, I thought we were all kind of protected. And I do have the books here if anyone wants to look at them. But uh, the excitement is that we have found, well, one thing we found out that the Newport Dunes used to be called the Harry Welsh Memorial Park. Now, what happened to poor Harry? <laughs> I don't know, but he was quite a leader in his day, so uh, that may be something we might want to look into. And on uh, Bay Avenue, just two blocks from our house, is a very, very beautiful old clapboard house that is on page number 50 in our preservation. And it is supposed to be the very first fire station and police station that was in Balboa. But the other one down close to the fun zone is the one that's listed. So we have a little uh, situation there. But we, this group, just loves what they're doing. And we went out with the map. And in fact, if I could excuse me. Markers with staff. We as volunteers uh, can't get this much done so fast, so we thank him very much. But these are the existing markers, and what has happened here is we went around, and these are all you can see basically where most of them are down on the peninsula. Uh, some of these are existing, but uh, Red ones are new, and uh, yellow ones uh, are also in question. So we have lots of uh, more, you know, research to do. But we're excited, and we have some uh, men that uh, are involved with the historical society, and I won't tell you what they're up to, but uh, they've got some exciting news about uh, a museum here and they care so much about the history and preserving things uh, that uh, that will be coming up and uh, I think this idea of before tearing down we do have pictures of them tearing down the Bank of America as we all stood kind of screaming and yelling at them but that was about the only defense we had but we didn't do what you have suggested and I think it's exciting. And we're not going to start going around taking photographs of everything in its, you know, the, the condition that it is in right now of the ones that we have listed. And uh, so we'll at least have that. And whatever we can do, we're a small committee, but it, it grows. And a lot of people can just spend a little time, but with one project. So uh, anything you need from us. Let me, let me ask you, is there a move afoot to you this present building and this site is so historical not to be changed? No, we we would <laughs> we would no. I we just I just want to know if, if, we, if, if this is no. the now, if this we, is the move that we have not heard of yet. What we do want is the facade of it, like the one down at McFadden Square. We would like to see the facade on the front like that. That's the only thing that we. So you want to carry like out that headquarters? Okay. <laughs> that's it. Okay. Okay. So, so that's to, I, I think that what we have here is a, an indication that we need to work with our community volunteer groups to to have uh, a, a historical preservation that is related to a volunteer group providing input to the city and and. Uh, adding our policies rather than actually a general plan what we need section. To be policy. I yeah. think the Newport Beach Historical Society and the Sherman Library and Gardens do need physical help down there and volunteers because it's it's very difficult. Their hours are are short, and but there are people who are interested now because of the centennial and because of the heritage. And we're getting people who want to go down there and help and have the hours are so few, and so it's very difficult to go down and do research with the, the people there. So uh, this interest is exciting, you know, and I think that our historical society needs to have more support either from the city and or from volunteers. Yeah. 
Thank so. you, Gay, for all okay. the, the work that you've done oh, so far. And I didn't even like history in school, see? <laughs> but I love it now. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, we'll close uh, public comment on that. City Clerk. Mr. Mayor. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Um, we're, we're dumping the historical element, but we didn't talk about H2, which deals with archaeological and paleontology, which is part of it. I was going to so suggest. Are we, are we dumping that, too? I was going to suggest that that's going to come back in the uh, natural resources section of the plan. Where it's a topic that has to get addressed. And well, we'll I, I, I was going to say, I, I recall that being a mandatory yep. aspect. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it'll come back in uh, natural resources. Okay. Isn't that also very strongly covered in our policy manuals? Yeah. So. State law requires it. Good catch. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Now we'll move on. Item number two, arts and cultural resources element. Okay, this again is another uh, optional element as we indicated below, not mandated by a state. It focuses on three particular components of arts and culture. One is, uh, is a, a section of policies, the basic goal of addressing the participation in cultural and arts programs. The second, addressing the physical facilities. And the third, addressing the funding. The first policy talks about the participation aspect of it as well, and you will see uh, in, in the document a number of specific uh, policies here. Again, maybe addressing both uh, the uh, uh, in the revised version, public and private projects, uh, promotion of the arts events and programs, and arts education. Uh, the GPAC made a number of changes in this area, which the, G, uh, the uh, Planning Commission also sort of deviated from as well. So let me have Sharon maybe explain the latter part of this. The, um, I think it would be easier if I just explain where the Planning Commission ended up. Um, policy 1.1 would um, read to encourage the incorporation of public art into public projects that enhance the city's community character as well as its built environment through public art donations and working with local artists, students, and community groups to create public art projects. Then there would be original. an, sorry? I was just gonna say the original text. The, the original text, yes. Um, and then there would be a new policy 1.2 dealing with private projects. And that would read, the city should encourage artwork to be installed and funded by private developers for larger residential and commercial projects. Uh, let, let me ask you a preliminary question. That is Robin's comment. This oh. is an optional item? It is. True or not? And, do we, and, and so the same, is the same question that we just had apply here? Was that question presented to the Planning Commission? No, it was, and we told them it was optional, but we didn't specifically ask that question. And uh, is, is there a distinction here? Do we not have any policies already to dealing with this, this topic? Mm, I, don't, I don't think we, we do. Don't. I mean, if you, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't know, then I suggest that we probably don't. Um, this element is one that was suggested by the Arts Commission. They actually presented a draft of the element to GPUC back when we were scoping out the general plan update, and that is the document that EIP worked from. Um, the chairman of the Arts Commission is here this evening. He was at the GPAC meeting on Saturday, um, so they think it's an important thing, and I believe that they are happy with the policies um, as EIP has drafted them, but still it's the council's decision whether you want to have it at all. All right, because the practical effect is because I've built projects where this is part of the general plan, and all of a sudden I'm putting up a hundred thousand dollar piece of sculpture as a requirement of getting a building permit. Because it says encourage. Well, I understand, but it was more than encourage. It, you know, it was the quid pro quo, getting it done. So that is, and I'm not saying it has to be that amount either, and it doesn't have to be that mandatory, but that is the practical effect of some of these when, they, when it boils down to applying it to a specific project. Go ahead. Is there anything more to the Planning Commission and the Jeep Puck. Uh, the um, they, they kept I think 
the, the um, um, yeah. policy one point, what well, was two, three underlined the promotion of the cultural arts. The, the, just being clear what they did here, uh, Sharon for 1.1 1 .1 addressed how the um, Planning Commission uh, created two policies out of that. So policy 1.2, what's entitled private projects here, was, would be deleted by the Commission, uh, not retaining what the GPAC said. Policy 1.3, which was originally two, they kept the GPAC recommendation um, in that case. And then 1.4, 1.5 were not changed, and they retain those, of course. And the GPAC recommendation on that new policy 1.3 was to read, build public awareness and encourage participation in the city's arts and cultural activities. The language regarding um, promoting our cultural and historic assets to visitors was already covered in a later policy. Okay, is that... Oh, and, and one other one other change that the uh, Planning Commission recommended was that we add to both the background discussion and um, add a goal and some policies with regard to our, our city's library services, okay. which they also consider to be part of culture. Since this is a quick section, uh, a short section, let me go through the other two goals real fast. The second section, goal uh, CA2, deals with the physical facilities. Uh, neither made any changes to the original text in that section. Uh, the third section dealing with funding, uh, the change that was made was to uh, the very last policy you will see here that the GPAC added in respect to encouraging the City Council to increase funding for arts and maintain consistent levels of funding. The, the Planning Commission felt that they needed to defer to you as to whether that should be added or not and did it feel comfortable making a recommendation in respect to that. So in effect did not make a recommendation to retain that uh, particular policy. Okay, Mr. Nichols. Uh, a question, would religious uh, symbols be allowed in such a, and if not, why not on equal basis? Defer to the city attorney. It depends upon what you're talking about. If this is uh, dealing with private development, then we wouldn't control what they did for public art. So a cross or so forth could be put up in front of a guy's development if he wanted to encourage artwork, and and that would be allowed within our uh, within our the scope. Or is this something that's going to be as long as it well. It's really kind of the kind that kind of hypothetical question is really kind of beyond the scope of what I would be able to advise you tonight on. The general restrictions are if there was you know city financing involved in it as opposed to requiring a private developer to, to encourage developers to put up art and, or make art part of their development, we wouldn't get involved in the content of what that art looked like. I would think as long as it was art and not signage under our signage. Right. Correct. So so we could it could be art or architectural features, and so if they felt that a cross was an important part of an architectural feature of their building, we wouldn't be able to prevent them from doing that. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, having the pleasure of uh, serving on the uh, ad hoc committee for interview of uh, plant or uh, art commission for our Arts Commission, I have been rather strident in my continued comments that I think our city needs much more in terms of art and cultural resources than it currently has. For a city of our size and our population and quite candidly our wealth, um, we are at bare minimum and we really don't have a policy. And I read through this, uh, this optional, optional element, and as I read through it, I tried to put myself in a time frame of 10 years ago today and 25 years from now. And it, it, it read pretty well, uh, in my opinion. And I, while there is some preamble, um, 
you, you know, there are events and festivals that they talk about, will they be here 10, 15, 20 years from now? Perhaps not, <clears throat> but at the same time, I thought the goals and policies, as originally drafted, were, fought, were not all, they were acceptable to me, and matter of fact, um, I, I would encourage that we, we move forward with this, this element to give a greater exposure to our community uh, and to the city council, quite candidly, that we do have arts and culture in our city, and uh, it sometimes is overlooked uh, uh, in this city. But um, uh, I, I know it's an optional element, <clears throat> but I, I personally support it. Um, in, including the part that we could require as a condition of development? No. No, I want to encourage. I, I worked in the city of Brea. I did three centers in the city of Brea. They have a they have a mandatory requirement up there for art pieces. And quite candidly, I found it offensive then. And I don't think that the city of Brea, other than being known for a city that forces art, uh, can. The, the, a lot of those art pieces are, are are not something that I think our citizens would be proud of. To be honest with you. But I would encourage, but I certainly wouldn't require. I'd go to the original language as stated in here. Okay. Encourage is the language the Planning Commission recommended. Yeah. Okay. I, I think there are citizens and developers that clearly would do that. I, I see that not being a problem. Certainly the Irvine Company did it with the Buffalo. Maybe they were forced into it they by... They required to do that. Well, okay. Councilman Daigle? I see that this aspect of our community can be further developed, and I think if you leave it to encouraging certain things, um, it could be said that we encourage it now. It's, it's simply not happening. So I would support um, stronger language of requiring it, but I'd like to see it maybe crafted in such a way that you don't have to actually give a physical piece of art, but perhaps contribute to something that maybe even the Arts Commission could make the selection on the, on the piece of art. Okay, Mr. Selich. Well, this is this is another one that's a borderline issue for me. Um, I think we've got to be careful about getting into optional elements, um, things that are really unique and necessary to the city. Like I have no problem with the bay and harbor element because that's obviously such a significant aspect of our community. It subsists the heart of the community. Something like this, I think, can be as easily handled with the policy as it can be by by an element, uh, but looking at the language, I almost say no harm, no foul here because it's so general and not requiring anything. It almost doesn't do anything. In fact, I'm kind of wondering what it, what it really does do. And uh, I guess the question I'd ask the staff is what kind of follow-up things would we be doing to uh, to uh, implement this? Um, you know, would we be talking about adopting ordinances that would require art donations or in lieu contributions? I mean, where, where would we be heading with this? Well, I, th I think within courage language, we wouldn't be adopting ordinances. Um, we would probably have discussions with major developers to try and do the encouraging for public art. Um, and really, most of this um, would be um, implemented by um, the library department and the arts division there. Um, so I'm at a little bit of a loss to talk about. Well, yeah, see, that's, I, I guess that's my point, is how does it rise to the level of being an element of the general plan if we're not really doing anything with it? I mean, Doesn't this doing? violate your previous suggestions that or, or goals that uh, the goal should be a subject? It should be that we will have yeah, art. We need to rewrite all the of The policy that. is shall. The, 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 the policy that encourages not meet the standard. So you told us that that's not good enough. Can I have a clarification here? The, the encourage language we're talking about is in policy 1-1? One, one. Is that what we're... Yes. Isn't that talking about public projects, not private developments? Or am yeah, I misreading that? The, the heading there is for public projects, and, and the first sentence deals with public projects. The second sentence deals with private projects. The Planning Commission recommended two things there. One, that that be a separate policy with a heading of private projects, and that it read as follows. 
the city should encourage artwork to be installed and funded by private developers for larger residential or commercial projects. Okay, so that's encouraged, that's not required. That's right. So nowhere in any plan would you say we're going to require in private developments? Correct. So, because I think, I don't know, I thought that's what we were talking about. So it's, that, that language is not in any of the versions? No, it's not. Okay, great. So then the question is, do we want to require it in major public projects, not private developments? Even there, the Planning Commission said encourage. Well, to the extent that the public projects are going to be done by us, I guess it will be at our option at those times to include it or not. That's, That's right. what they suggested. So. You need to set the example. And then 1.2 is the private projects? Yes. Okay. There is, by the way, there are two council policies with regard to art. One is art in public places, um, but it speaks only to the city acquiring um, artworks um, to go in, into public places for the enjoyment of the public. And then the second policy um, is with regard to financial support for culture and arts, and that refers to the $55,000 per year that's provided, and, and those are the sub-grants that the Arts Commission provides. That, that's not really part of this. Um, actually, we have a public art piece that was supposed to go in um, uh, McFadden Square. It's uh, somewhere in storage. It's kind of a Ruth Goldberg-type uh, sculpture thing. I don't, I don't know whatever happened to that. Don, do you remember that thing? Anyhow, it didn't happen. Um, I, I'm not sure why or what. No, no what happened is that there was a, a design uh, contest and there were a number of different proposals and one was adopted and the model was here. Right. But it was never implemented. Uh, the only other real public arts piece was the twisted steel eye beam that's up at Superior, that the blue one that's now <laughs> that okay. was here for a long time. Um, I, yeah, I guess just a general comment. You know, uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and I know on the McFadden Square one and even the twisted eye beam. Um, <laughs> I'd hate to see council trying to take those on. I, I guess that's what an arts commission is for, by the way. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Nichols? If this were in the public way, it seems to me that you're prohibited from putting up a religious piece. <laughs> According to the ACLU, you can't do anything like that on public property. If we can't do that, it seems to me I can't do the other either. All right. Are we uh, are we close to a point where we can give direction? Why don't we open it up to public comment since the head of the arts commission is here, and maybe he can enlighten us as to maybe. Well, let's let's ask whether the arts commission has a, has a position on this. Should this be part of the general plan or not? Come on down, Kerwin. <laughs> well, you know what that answer is going to be. <laughs> well, let's hear. The let's arts hear commission one. is very interested in researching the possibility of a public art component in for the city of Newport Beach. We're actually right now undertaking a review of what other comparable cities are doing in the United States, in California, and also in the western United States. What we would propose is that we come to the city council after we investigate what we would feel would be appropriate to present to, to city council. Good. Then you don't have an opinion whether this has to be part of the general plan. You, you want to do your research, come back with your findings, and then present something in substance, something in detail to the City Council to consider that's adopting. Correct. That's correct. If I could also just say what the Arts Commission presented was in April of 2003 by my previous, by my predecessors. Uh, we presented that to GPAC and we frankly didn't hear anything or any results until just this past week. When we found out what was happening, I attended the meeting. So there had been some changes from what um, the Arts Commission had presented. We feel that the uh, staff had done an exceptional job in incorporating and expanding what our goals and policies were. So there's still a dialogue going on. The GPAC's recommendations have not been presented to the Arts Commission yet. And I was going to do that at our next meeting on October 13th. So we have a little bit of incomplete information right now. 
Okay, let me ask you a question. Would, would the Arts Commission be in favor of requiring private developers uh, to either contribute into a fund to put up public art or to, to, to install public art on projects? Yes. You would. Okay. Good. Any questions for Kerwin up here? And Mr. Mayor, something like that could be incorporated in a council policy rather than the general plan, as we talked about. Yes. That's right. Great. Thanks. Uh, since I've opened it up for public comment, anybody else want to speak on this? Okay, good. I'll, I'll close. Not good. I'll just close public comment. Okay. I'll bring it back, Ms. Sellage. Yeah, I'd be in favor of eliminating this right now and, and see what happens uh, with what the Art Commission comes back with and then at that time take a look as to whether we want to have an element or deal with it as a policy level situation. Okay, okay that's a no. That's a no. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing. Mr. Webb? I think that uh, it could be, a, I like the idea of the policy rather than the general plan because a policy just takes a vote of the City Council at a meeting to change it whereas the general plan requires a long drawn out process that can take as long as six to eight months and uh, if we find something doesn't work then we, we have to, we're saddled with that so I would support uh, the adopting a policy later on. Okay, is that a no then? Not part no. of the general plan. Okay. No. Mr. Rosansky? Okay, I passed. Mr. Nichols? A no? <coughs> Councilman Daigle? Sorry, uh, I think with the Arts Commission help and, and the information they come up with, we can kind of get to where we are going to be through a council policy. So that's another no. Okay. Mr. Ridgeway? Yeah, um, we need to be further along than where we currently are, period. Um, I think there's a lot of people in our community that don't recognize we have an Arts Commission. Um, or any type of policy, which it appears we, it's minimal. So um, if, if we can accomplish, uh, accomplish it through a policy, um, and I do agree with Mr. Webb, it's easier to change a policy than it is a general plan, um, then I, I certainly would support that. But we do need to uh, encourage some, some type of uh, incorporation of the uh, uh, of the whole concept of arts and culture in, into our uh, city fabric. Good. That's another no. Mr. Rosansky? I'll go with the flow. Okay, that's the flow vote. Okay. I want to thank you, Mr. Rockford, for coming down. I want to thank you for the work on the Arts Commission and the Commission itself, because you're doing a lot. You know, I think we're gaining momentum in this area. I think we're headed in the right direction. We can come back to a policy, uh, council policy action on it instead. Okay. Sharon, do you have direction? Yes. Good. It's getting thinner. Oh, we already did it. <laughs> it's required. <laughs> oh, you're you're stuck so. this time. The next okay. one's not going to work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Item number three, the public safety element. Okay, this is a long and complex element. I'm going to try to touch briefly upon the basic organization of this document um, as well. It is required by the state. This is an update of the existing element that you have in place. It draws many of its policies from the, though not all, from the draft LCP, local coastal plan, particularly where they are applicable in inland areas as well as within the coastal district as well. You see the topics. Uh, if you look at the basic organization, and I'm not uh, I'm going to save a little bit of time here rather than going through each slide, but to, it, there is basically, just so you understand the organization in sequence, a uh, first goal and a series of policies related to coastal hazards themselves. A second uh, go, uh, goal uh, in S2 is related to storm surges and seiches. The third is related to coastal erosion. The, the GPAC made an inappropriate revision and also includes storm surges in there. We have deleted that, as did the commission. Uh, the next section, fourth, deals with seismic and geological hazards. I'll point out a couple of deletions as we get to that section that the, um, that the uh, GPAC had recommended that the 
uh, Planning Commission restored, particularly from our counsel to them, that uh, there are some of these items that are actually required to be incorporated in your general plan by state law. So they actually incorporated policies that you have to have in here for a legally adequate uh, general plan. Uh, the next uh, section uh, deals with flooding hazards. Then there is fire hazards that deals with both urban and wildland fire. Uh, there is a section then dealing with hazardous materials, hazmat. Then there is a section dealing with aviation hazards. And then finally as a section, and we'll come to this as we talk specifically about the section that the uh, um, commission was looking for some expansion on, and that's the whole arena of disaster preparedness and disaster planning and response to disasters. And I think obviously that's a very timely comment, uh, concern of the community. So I'll just start by the very first one, and we can jump into the policies in this section dealing with um, coastal hazards themselves. Uh, the, let me just indicate what the commission did in this section under policy uh, S1.4, which uh, in, in the uh, version you have in front of you from the GPAC indicated the GPAC had deleted it. There is a central portion of this that deals with evacuation routes, i.e. disaster response. The commission was very concerned about its deletion and wants to have some specific policies dealing with community evacuation and suggested moving that into the uh, disaster preparedness section or the last section of this plan on the goal. Uh, the other change that the commission made from the, um, from the uh, GPAC was to retain policy S1.9 in addressing the issue of tsunami research, uh, both inshore, offshore and onshore. Uh, so they retained the recommendations for the deletion of 17 and 18. Mr. Mayor, your Web policy S1.3 says prepare and deploy a system of tsunami detection and early warning systems. How is the city going to do that? It's my understanding these detection systems are out in the middle of the ocean and, and uh, uh, deployment, uh, us deploying something in the middle of the Pacific or up in Alaska or any place else. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be terribly, uh, I think that we could subscribe to uh, the, was it, is it NOAA, NOAA's system to where we have some sort of direct contact, which I think is a part of our disaster preparedness now, but I, I don't see how it's possible for us to, to do that. I thought this was more intended to talk about um, early warning to our residents as we receive information from regional or national agencies, but Chief Riley is here and he may be able to speak more intelligently on this. Well, and, and I think Don's correct though. You, the, the word deploying is probably an improper word in that goal. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, co coordinate Participate in. Or participate in, but deploying, we can't deploy in the, up in Alaska. Well, we can't prepare the detection systems either. I, I understand the notification to, to our citizens as a part of our disaster preparedness is a, a part of this, and we may need to have some sort of system to where we can notify people living along the beach, but that, that's still not an early deployment. It, no, it's not the, the system itself. Loosely speaking, can you deploy a warning? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. No. no. Mr. Mayor? So let's we deploy um, our police officers. Are there any policies in this section that um, are in the LCP? All of them. All of these are in the LCP? Yes. So we, we've already adopted the prepare and deploy policy and what was submitted to the Coastal Commission? I presume. <laughs> Come on over here. I'm not going to go through that again. Um, I believe that mo that these policies were taken out of the LCP. If we knew right now, uh, before next week, that there were uh, some adjustments on th this type of stuff. I I'm sure that we could talk to the commission or their staff and they would have no problem making some of these minor adjustments because the intent is the same. I don't think they're expecting us to implement a state or 
or West Coast wide uh, solution. So, okay. well, perhaps we should make that part of our actions tonight if that's what we end up doing. And I'd kind of like to know as we go through all the rest of these which ones are in the LCP so that we can know what we're dealing with here. So, so would you call that an alert system instead of a Tusami detection system? Something like that? I mean, if we change one word to try and make this applicable? Tim, I can't think of any other potential disaster other than a tsunami that there might be the opportunity to have a warning of. So. Wildfire. Other sections later on that. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Tim Riley, Fire Chief. Um, uh, actually, if we were talking about the public safety element after next council study session, we'd probably be a little bit more prepared, including myself. Um, but I will say that there are uh, absolute, actually a uh, couple opportunities where, where early warning would be necessary for residents and evacuation systems, uh, such as uh, uh, a recent disaster drill uh, identified the potential of a fire, and so we could actually uh, warn residents in fire-prone areas to evacuate or prepare. So that's one idea of an early warning system. The same thing might occur with um, uh, unusual flooding situations. Um, but most disasters that are going to strike Newport Beach are, uh, are immediate and have instant uh, impact. And so early warning is not going to really work for us. Uh, in the issue of tsunamis, for example, there's really two types, Pacific-wide and local. So the Pacific-wide tsunami, we do get warnings through NOAA, uh, and that's just part of the state warning system that automatically uh, happens. And we'll talk about that in more detail at our council meeting. But for a local tsunami, uh, there really is no warning system. Uh, it really is just a, a tsunami that's created by a, a, a giant earth movement of any type uh, off our near shore, creating some sort of tsunami wave. And really the actual uh, seismic action that creates that would be the only warning that we would probably have. Um, I agree that it's impractical for us to think that we would have some detection system that would prepare us in that regard. And so really when we talk about early warning systems, they're really only applicable for, I think, Pacific-wide tsunamis and in the rare case where we might have some advanced notice of or advanced preparation for the potential of impacts from fires or floods. Tim. Chief, would that, uh, the calling of that an alert system instead of a detection system, would that be, I mean, that's really what you're doing, is it not, is alerting the citizens of what the Actually, that's correct, Councilmember Nichols. And in our presentation next week, one of the things we're going to be talking about is the issue of alerting and warning and, and the difference between the two. Uh, but principally, that's what it's about, is to notify residents of our desire for them to take some sort of an action. Um, just so we're on record, you agree with removing the word deploying an early tsunami detection system? Yeah, I don't think that's very practical. <laughs> certainly very, sure, certainly idealistic, but not practical. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me ask you another component, and that would be the all clear component. In other words, telling people there isn't any danger, too. I assume that's, because uh, after this Crescent City one, there were people that said, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what the status quo was. That's correct. It, it really has to do with creating a system of communicating with our residents on both the need for them to take some action um, for themselves or uh, the information that says that they don't have to. No, that's fine. So it really it's all about coming up with a really good, solid communication system. It's really going to be steeped more in education and preparedness as to the way we're going to do that, not necessarily the system that we use. But is what are what we talking about really in the in the third component of this, the all hazard response, or rather in, in, than in the last, specific, the last section on the disaster last section. planning, isn't that more where this should yes. be? Yes, yeah. correct. Good. Thanks. Anything else here? Okay. Thank you, Chief. All right. How do you want to take this? You want to take this in pieces, since this is a very elaborate one, or do you want to sections, or uh, by by goal? So if we can finish with goal S1, which is with regard to tsunamis and rogue waves. Well, I, I think you have sufficient direction at this point in time. And if that's if the only it, policy with comment. Yeah. And I think we're move on. Great bunch. Okay, the next section deals with um, storm surges and seizures. Uh, all the policies are from the LCP, uh, Council Member Selich. 
the um, changes um, that are recommended. Um, can, Sharon, can you elaborate upon again the deletion of S2.8 because I've forgotten. This one. Yeah. Construction of seatbelts. The, oh, the, the commission suggested deleting two, S2.8. At, yes. Actually, they agreed with GPAC suggesting that 2.8 be deleted. And the reason that GPAC made that recommendation was that they felt that the city should not prevent itself from protecting public property from storm surges. Yeah. That's right. I, I couldn't agree more. S2.8 should be deleted in its but entirety. Th this is one that's in the LCP, I believe. Yes. No. no? No, we, we, we purposely, it is not in there. Yeah. I think we beat that up. But, but are we saying we prohibit people from protecting their property? No. Their property on public property. Prohibit the construction of seawalls, groins, or other hard devices to protect public property. No. Public. Okay, so that's... Public. Regard only to public property. That's, That's right. Okay. I, I, I have a question about um, 2.4. Is that in the LCP? Yes. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm not too keen on that. And I think we've seen that in West Newport where people are taking their own hands to remove dunes. I wouldn't really want to encourage placement of more dunes there. I don't think it's very popular with the oceanfront homeowners, and I don't think I would want to encourage that. If they occur naturally, it's one thing, but I don't think the city should be encouraging the construction of sand dunes along the peninsula or West Newport. This would, uh, if a private person did it, it would have to be on his property, right? Well, that's virtually impossible. I think this, is use, this isn't creation of new dunes. I think this is just use of sand dunes. Do you think this is stabilizing existing yeah. dunes? Right. Oh, we should probably add the word existing, encourage the use of existing sand dunes with native right. vegetation. This is really to stabilize the dunes that exist, I would think. Uh, the sand dunes are the last resource yeah, to keep could, wave yeah. uprush from going into the front rooms of your houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, they do block views. But that extra foot or two also blocks the water. And I know that the selfish views of, not selfish, I shouldn't say that, but the views of people that are impaired from the first floor porches, uh, uh, there's going to be a time when the waves rush up and uh, that's going to keep the water out and it's going to save the city a whole lot of, of woe when we try to protect these houses if we have that extra little barrier. I notice we. We allow for the placement of temporary berms uh, in policy S2.3. Uh, right, that's temporary. That's temporary, but I still think that it's uh, uh, you can get a sudden storm coming <laughs> through, and we're not going to be able to have the time. If you have your natural dunes in place, uh, and we should encourage the dunes that are there today to not be lowered. Uh, on the basis that uh, if we do, uh, I guess I can think of one instance uh, a number of years ago that that uh, the people asked General Services to lower the dunes. This is between uh, the northerly the Balboa Pier, and the next uh, about two years later, we had I think this was 1983 or 84. The place, the only place where the water actually came through and flooded Balboa Boulevard was where these dunes were lowered. Uh, Again, that's not down in, in the West Newport area, but I, I think that fiddling with our dunes, uh, which is our, our last natural uh, protection, is, is a dangerous thing to do. Well, I think a lot of the dunes that are there are not natural. They're, they were because of vegetation that grew on the beach, such as ice plant and things like that, which are not native plants. We've manufactured dunes over the years, but again, I... I mean, it's one thing for a dune that's there. Obviously, we're not going to be tearing out dunes that are currently exist. I mean, we've seen that with the recent Coastal Commission letters to us requiring us to, or I guess requiring us, not even requesting, that we replace the dune that was um, dismantled by someone, I guess. We had, 
haven't acknowledged yet who that is, but um, I, I don't know that I'd want to encourage the use of sand dunes. With I mean, to me, that language sounds like you're going to be putting in more dunes, and I don't know that that's what we want to be doing. Was it just the opposite that we that we will prohibit the removal of any existing? I had suggested that we just add the word existing so it reads encourage the use of existing sand dunes with native vegetation as a protective device. Uh, I would, I guess, accept that language. Or instead of encourage the use, uh, encourage the existence of the protection of existing sand dunes. Yeah. Uh, listen, listen. That's how we make, that's how us lawyers make a living. Mr. Mayor. In a very expensive way. We don't have to wordsmith this. Yes, Mr. Mr. Uh, Selich. On uh, policy S2.7, uh, what language was the language that the Planning Commission ended up going with here? Uh, as recommended yes. by GPAC. Okay, using required by building codes. Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. I suppose what we could do is go back and look at the land use element and see what kind of policies we came up with regards to these sand dunes and come up with some language that um, reflects. It's not going to um, be in land use. Huh? It's not going to be in land use. No, I'm sorry. The local coastal plan. Oh, ah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misspoke. Because the land use. Wait a minute, we yes. got a draft. <laughs> no, the, and then and then compare that whatever is in that policy with this language and make sure that. We try and, and um, address your concern, the Councilmember Rosansky's concerns. I'd like to go along with Mr. Webb, though, that sometimes these are the protection <coughs> for the coastal properties, and if they're required, uh, we need to put them in. I mean, if, if that's what it takes to, we probably saved a lot of damage on some of our our coastal storms that we had this year by putting in dunes and and I certainly would not want to prohibit that from happening I, I think we have a uh, some requirement there to protect properties and we should have the option of doing that as we see the best way to handle that well I think that's addressed in as councilman Webb pointed out in 2.3 it says to continue to utilize temporary sand dunes in shoreline areas to protect buildings and infrastructure from wave rush up while minimizing significant impact to coastal access and resources. So there is a provision in time of need to create dunes there, which I think the city does on a regular basis to protect parking lots and structures and, and things when they at least have some advance warning of a storm. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm saying that if we're going to go out there and actively construct dunes and plant native vegetation so we're going to have permanent dunes out on the beach, I'm not in favor of that, at least in being in our general plan. We couldn't do that anyhow uh, per the uh, LCP. So the, the one word, I mean, we're kind of beating something up that's already been agreed to on 2.4. Let's just add the word existing. Let's move on. What are the components? This okay. great. Thanks. The next goal addresses coastal erosion. Uh, and again, if you have the GPAC. I'm sorry. There were a few other policies at the end of. Oh, sorry. Never mind. Never mind. I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> the uh, next section that addressed coastal erosion, you will see some language that was incorrectly uh, added. Well, excuse me. Yes. When are we going to deal with the slab height? For, is this, you know, is this what we've already covered that? In other words, we're requiring slab heights at a certain, you know, at a certain level. Da da da. All right, it's good. So that's already there. We took yes. the feet out. Good. So Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, this one again is the, uh, addressing coastal erosion. Is, is, uh, the, as you'll see in red, the uh, GPAC added in storm surges, which the uh, Planning Commission deleted because it's not relevant. The section is strictly coastal erosion. You will see uh, all the policies read again. The, the Commission also kept retained policy 3.7, uh, which uh, the GPAC had deleted. We'll come back to the, the reasoning, reasoning for that in a moment. Uh, all of the policies up to 
what's listed as 3.9 or original 3.10 are from the LCP, the latter two, 3.10 or 3.11 and 3.11-12, uh, were in addition to what is in the LCP and it's a reflection of uh, codes and ordinances of the city today. Um, the, uh, Sharon, maybe can you share the commission's thinking on 3.7 and not because I've, this was for consistency, I believe, on the protection uh, of uh, private property. Um, the, well, this is the policy that discourages shoreline protective, protective devices system. on public land to, to protect, protect private, private property. property. Right. Um, and I honestly don't remember why the GPAC recommended that that be deleted, but the Planning Commission this restored. afternoon thought that that should be restored. Um, and then... 3.7? Yes, 3.7. And that's in our existing LCP, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, and then the GPAC recommended um, a couple of language changes in um, 3.10 and 3.11. In, in 3.10, um, site and design new structures to avoid the need for shoreline and bluff protective devices during the economic life of the structure. And they added unless an environmentally acceptable design to stabilize the bluff and prevent bluff retreat is devised. And that was added uh, because of a concern that if you outright prohibit anything to um, stabilize a bluff, then you would be losing that landform and there would be um, other impacts with, with mud flow and the sediment from those. Um, but there might be some environmentally acceptable ways to um, stabilize that slope and preserve it. And so the Planning Commission agreed with that addition. Um, and then uh, S3.11 um, was just a clarification, um, require that applications for new development with the potential to be impacted uh, or impact coastal erosion to include slope stability analyses. And Planning Commission agreed with that as well. Okay. Is that it for that That's section? Mr. Selich, we can get some light so we can run through this. Thank you. Oh. Um, Mr. Mayor, so yes. basically Planning Commission kept everything as is. Um, with the exception of accepting the additional language proposed by GPAC in 10 and 11. Well, they maintained the current language. No, they accepted the additions proposed by GPAC. Oh, I, I'm sorry. There are too many documents up here, sorry. Okay. All right, any, Mr. Selich? No, I'm, I'm okay with the Planning Commission recommendations on all this. Okay, your go for that. Any other comment on this? Not to shorten it, but... I, I think it really needs more discussion to kind of tie it all together, for me anyway, from an engineering standpoint. But I, uh, so I, I really uh, don't think I can make an educated decision on this. Well, how would you change it? I, I can't tell you right now, John. I, I think it has to be tied down in a discussion that makes it, it, there's it places here where we seem to be saying that as a private individual you can't protect your own property by putting something on a public land, <coughs> but you could put it on private land and, oh, you might need to get an environmental okay before you did it. And chances are this is going to be a storm type situation whether you either protect your property or it goes down the tubes. And uh, in those cases, I believe we need to, to relatively leave people the, uh, the uh, right to do this. Uh, and, and if they cause uh, massive damage by doing it, uh, they have some liability for it. But I, I understand that uh, it, it's it's a difficult situation. I think it has to be thought through more. But, for example, we had a, in Morning Canyon, a guy starts losing his bluff and he does nothing to protect it. And then he turns around and wants to sue everybody else for it. I, it seems to me we should require those people that are under that kind of a situation to do something 
to try not not something stupid. I mean, they have to do it in an educated fashion, but I believe we they should be allowed to do it and and uh, and encouraged to do it. Well, I guess the, on the opposite side, if you do something and do the wrong thing, then you open yourself up to the liability. You have done the wrong thing, you could be damaging neighboring property, sort of like the innocent bystander that comes in and tries to give life-saving help and kills the victim who wouldn't have died otherwise. I mean, that, that's the problem you have when you encourage people to take matters in their own hands and then they don't do the wise thing, then all of a sudden, by taking action, they've done the wrong thing. My, my question there is in the Morning Canyon washout, we went down and fixed the pipe. If we well, didn't fix the pipe, would we have washed out the property? That's still on Right. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Nichols is describing a, um, you know, a, a, a spontaneous and, and disastrous situation. Much of this is in anticipation of those type of events. So, um, I, I support everything that the Planning Commission did. I think they did a good job. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Did the Planning Commission also removed 3.7? I, I guess I'm confused. No. It shows they, they, they restored they it. it. They supported it. Okay, they so, it okay, that's fine. They put it back in. Okay. Does the word discourage, this is another word that is not a positive. And then, again, you said we have to have positive statements here. What do you mean by so that? You are... Uh, you're listening to me, and I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I'm not sure just again about that, but I'll go for that. <laughs> this, thank you for the semi-endorsement there. It, it leaves some discretion, which is probably wise. Yeah, and, and I believe, and I don't know the thinking that led it from the LCP, but we felt that we wanted to be as consistent as possible and just use the language for uh, consistency here. So well, I, I, I thought that the, the guidance from the state guidelines said don't use terms like should and encourage and discourage if you don't mean to try it at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But if it's something that in some cases you would want to do, but not in every case, then yeah. don't you shall use encourage or should. Whether it's an absolute restriction. That was on page two. We only got page one, Sharon. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it goes on to 15. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. Next uh, section is uh, addressing geologic and seismic hazards. Uh, there were quite a number of areas that the GPAC took out from the original uh, version. Uh, the first policy, 4.1, uh, and, and we concur, as did the Planning Commission, that it's a very great amount of detail about applications and required what happens in the application process and think that's more applicable within the codes and ordinances of the city. However, uh, the, a couple of other deletions that they made, uh, if you will, jeopardize the legal adequacy of your general plan. 4.3 about supporting and encouraging the seismic retrofitting and strengthening of essential facilities. And essential facilities are defined by the state law and the code, the public resources code. Hospitals, schools, they're considered the uh, facilities that are essential to sustain a population, particularly after an emergency, such as police and fire facilities as well. Um, et cetera. So the, the first policy, 4.3, about supporting the retrofitting is normally incorporated in general plans and to satisfy state requirements. I, I would counsel you to include that within the plan. 4.5 and 4.6 similarly, again, address essential facilities and sensitive facilities. Again, both of those are defined by state law. These recommendations are consistent with the Public Resources Code, including the Alquist Prill Act and State Seismic Safety Element. However, uh, I do not believe the actual uh, discussion in all cases is now absolute prohibition. So what we're suggesting the Council consider is change the first word from prohibit to regulate, and it would say in accordance with the Public Resources Code, and we can identify the appropriate section. Well, let me give an example, Chief Riley. This is fire station right behind here. You want to rebuild it, you want to stick it in the same place, and I'd say it's probably in a seismic yeah, it is. danger zone, but you're recommending we put it in the same place. Wait a minute. Uh, our, our soils reports that we got back on the City Hall indicated yeah. that uh, we had some pretty good soil yeah. down there. Yeah, yeah. I, and that I, we I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, the fish swimming in the excavation area would disagree with you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 the the conflict comes in the area of 
the necessity for certain essential facilities to serve the community's regular everyday needs being in conflict with the uh, event of a seismic event that might in fact uh, create a, um, uh, a problem with the facility. So what you do is you still have to site them there. We can't now say, okay, we really can't have a fire station down the peninsula. We can't have one at City Hall because it's a seismically sensitive area. But what we do do is ensure that those facilities that have an essential facility connotation are constructed and maintained in the fashion that makes them least susceptible to damage in a seismic event. So it still need to have them Okay, but they need to be built and maintained appropriately to minimize the impact on them during an event. So would you be okay with regulate instead of Well, I, I think that there's two, there's two sections in here. One is when he talks about the regulation of other facilities, I think that that's exactly what our goal should be, and I think it is consistent with what the state law envisioned. On the final page, they talk about taking out the word ensure that existing essential facilities and that's where we talk about what I think are public safety essential, mm -hmm. essential facilities, police and fire facilities, and they say encourage. And, and that's really the one that I think really needs some teeth in it because, you know, that's our responsibility, I think, as local governments to be prepared for providing that level of service. And that's where I think that the city f essential facilities should have more teeth in it, where the others is really a regulatory function consistent with state law. Is there a difference between the fire station uh, or where an EOC is, Emergency Operations Center, versus a regular, I shouldn't say just regular, but a, but a fire station like the one behind here, uh, as to what's essential or not? No, they're, they're both would be considered essential facilities, as would any emergency communication center, which an EOC would be considered is an essential facility. So our police department, um, our police communication center, our EOC, which also happen to all be in the same building, all of our fire stations, our lifeguard headquarters, all of those would be considered essential facilities from a public safety standpoint, regardless of their location in the community. But you're saying because of the need to respond, some of those essential facilities have to be in? Seismically prone areas. Yes, because That's you right. need to react yes. to. Yes. So, so in other words, we can't say we can't have them here in anticipation of a 100-year event when we actually need them every single day. That's good. Great. Um, and, and I'd make a comment. In some cities, uh, uh, first of all, the fire station here may be in a seismically prone area, but uh, the soils report does not show a, uh, a high risk for uh, for liquefaction. Another function, you, another you can design around seismic by post tension slabs. I don't suggest that, nor did the. Uh, nor did our uh, soils engineer back here, but if you have emergency or essential buildings, again, there are ways to build them where everything else will fall around them and they won't. That's correct. And I'd, quite candidly, Hogue Hospital sits on that, but they, the new hospital building is on 54 isolators, and the, and the earth can actually move 18 inches or a total of like 36 inches total, and the building will not move. So it can be done, it's just expensive. Okay, um, Mr. Nichols. Um, I tend, well, I, I would tend to agree with what's been said. Uh, we have to have certain facilities here. The question is, is whether they should, whether they can be located and useful in other areas. And I'm, um, I would have to also agree that where we can avoid active faults and so forth, that it would make sense. An active fault being down Balboa Boulevard, that's uh, pretty close to some of our facilities. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit confused. Why did, why were these uh, items that are required to be in here struck out? What was the rationale for that? Well, that's GPAC. That GPAC. I, I think that GPAC felt that we, we needed to site some of these facilities um, in places that are seismically dangerous because of the nature of our city. Um, but I think ch um, changing the word to regulate takes care of that. Planning Commission felt the policy okay, so, should so be back in. What, what are you recommending that we keep in? We uh, 4.1 is out. <clears throat> we agree with deleting 4.1, restoring 4.3, 4.5 with changing the first word from prohibit to regulate, 4.6 again revising the first word from prohibit to regulate, 
and then supporting the fire chief on 4.3 or 7, whatever it is on the last one, from encourage to ensure. Yeah, I think that we, should, I sh we should adopt that. All right. I have a question yeah, for the fire agree. chief. Yes, Councilman Daigle. I support also ensuring that existing essential facilities be upgraded, but now we have the possibility where people would have to vote for that in terms of finances, and maybe I just want to get your thoughts on that. They have to vote on this, too? Well, um, <laughs> and not on every you know, that, policy. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I guess I would say that uh, you could count on me to be one of the campaign uh, group when we talk about the need for essential facilities to be uh, to meet certain standards. Um, you know, one of the things that we have in our current um, goals this year, which we're just about ready to send out a consultant, is a study of all of our essential public safety facilities to really get a big picture. And I think that you know, if the Populous decided to vote on that. I think that I think public law would be. I'm no attorney, but I think the case could be made that we would still have an obligation to move forward if we needed to. So I think it's just a financing issue, I guess. Uh, which tonight, well, I, guess that, I guess that's what it's about. Tonight, you're an attorney. So uh, we take I, I think that it, it's really from from a fire chief's perspective, it's my obligation to bring to you issues of public safety and to provide public notice of those. And then it's really the policy makers to make the decisions on what to do about that. And the populace get to decide how they want to deal with those policy makers. And that would be my, <laughs> my, that'd be my perspective on it because really my obligation is just to bring up issues of public safety. But it could be that a vote could possibly impair your ability to do that. Uh, or your ability. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Good, good. What Wait a minute. Are we, are, we clear, are we clear on this? Do you have uh, anybody else want to weigh in? Okay. Do you have direction? Yes. Good. Okay. Next. Okay. The next is dealing with flood hazards. Um, there are a couple of suggested changes here uh, from the committee, uh, from the planning commission. The, the the policies refer to both the 100 and 500 year flood plains and flood uh, areas within the city. They are mapped. They are mapped under the uh, fire insurance rate maps as well as the FEMA maps. Uh, the, the question we pose to the Planning Commission, though, is are the policies, should the policies in a 100 and 500 year floodplain be different? And basically, after some discussion, it was concurred that there is no reason to differentiate. The policies did not differentiate those two. So the actual technical change was to delete the reference to the 500 year floodplain. Uh, the other suggestion in here was to uh, agree with the deletion on 5.1, the GPAC recommendation, because that was a level of detail that they felt was not appropriate to a policy level of the general plan. And then secondarily, 5.2 is a policy that most appropriately belongs in that disaster preparedness and recovery section at the end of the document. Uh, and one other comment from the Planning Commission was they would like us to include, at least in the background, and I'm not sure if there was a policy yeah. implication as well, about the tidal gates and our closing of them being a man-made cause of flooding. No way. What? What do they want? <laughs> That's the extent to which I understand it, that we add some reference to um, our use of tidal gates, and it's that contributing to flooding being a man-made cause of flooding. That, I, I don't think that, that's appropriate at all. I, I don't either. I, I don't understand it, number one. And uh, well, I, 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 I tell you, within 10 years, all of our floodgates should be automatic, but they're not yet. Then I guess there's the opportunity for given high tides and, and rains that you would f close well, the tidal you, valve. You end up having to, to, there's a very delicate balance. Yes. If you have a large rainstorm at the exact same time with your highest tide, there will be a time when the water backs up um, uh, almost it, it, as far as if it, if it were uh, to be the high tide, and you won't be able to really tell the difference. And if you open the tide gate, and it's just a little bit higher, it'll go out. If it's a little bit lower, it'll come in. Well, I, I agree with Don. I mean, I, I, you're talking to a guy whose kitchen has uh, been impaired by either rain or, or, or you know, the, the high tides. So, um, 
I don't know why you can't you can't policy. tell the difference. I mean, once that rain comes in, that gate can be wide open. Well, I think the people out there are going to know what the right thing to do is based upon their experience and based upon their their being there. And we don't need any kind of policy. In no, that direction. no, I, I I clearly don't think so. I think the policies as written and described to us are, are adequate, and we need to go forward. Yep, I agree. Any other comment, Mr. Selich? Yeah, and I looked at this from a uh, from a vi as a victim. I agree. All right. <laughs> Would this provide us a liability the way they had written it, though? That I mean, as a city, that if the gates were not let's not go into hypotheticals. Blah blah blah. Are open that uh, the city would be have have it, a liability. I don't think it's we need to go It's not something that needs to be in the general plan, yeah. and it's just part of our standard operation. So which so which one is this that we've thrown out then? It, it, it which was policy? never in. It was never in there. Okay, this was the one they were going to add. Right. Yes. Haven't seen. Okay. But yep. we did re remove the words and 500, so it's only 100 yes. years. That's, I, I like that much better. I did have a question there, and, and it's just a, a question, and that is leaving a separate 500, you kind of see where the demarcation is between uh, final inundation with a much higher tide than, or how, you know, how tall the properties are. Or, Water. I mean, some of them make uh, the hundred-year tide without being inundated, and others are inundated on both. Obviously, maybe that's a, something worthwhile. Uh, letting people know what that is. Yeah, it, it, those are shown on the map. They, yeah, I they, see they, that. They will continue but, to be oh, shown. They would be continue, they continue to, to show those on the maps. It's there just, just would the be policies. no statements in the policies. Yes, yes correct. Okay. Yes, they're on the federal. Yeah, that's yes, what, exactly. That's what our guide is. And yep. So no matter what we do here, the federal flood maps are still going to do what they feel is appropriate for the city. That's yeah. correct. Let's move on. Okay. The next section addresses <coughs> fire hazards, uh, both to urban and um, uh, wildfires, uh, policies. Um, well, first the the first policy six point one to continue. The training sessions, that's been moved to the back again in disaster preparedness. It's not that they deleted the thought. The thought and the strategy appears later. So the ensuing policy is not in the LCP, but then the re remainder of the policies in the section are uh, on policy, as this policy 6.10, which is the property maintenance uh, that was suggested. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended restoring that in lieu of what was policy 6.7 or 8. <clears throat> the, the, the Commission was concerned about requiring annual inspections, and this goes back to a policy discussion for the Council, the requirement in a general plan to forever, in effect, during the life of the general plan, require annual inspections of parcels and urban wildland interface areas was a commitment they weren't quite prepared to make, so they defaulted to a 6.10 as being a more global policy uh, in terms of property maintenance and the responsibility for individual property owners to maintain those properties in the wildfire. Has Stop it right there. Chief Riley's shaking his head. You have the well, floor. Yeah. Sorry to be a contrarian here uh, <laughs> since I'm just looking at this for the first time tonight. Um, I, I agree uh, the, the strikeout, sir. Uh, I agree that I think that the idea of Memorializing the need for annual inspections is probably uh, an appropriate thing to do. But I also believe that the language that's in 6.78, if you were just to say continue to require property owners or continue the inspections of parcels in wildland area areas is much clearer because it really addresses the areas of urban wildlife, wildland interface. It also directs uh, property owners to be in compliance with fire inspection standards, which regulate things more than just fuel and vegetation management, but also regulates now under our, on our billing code and some of our fire codes, uh, property maintenance, dealing with construction standards, dealing with storage in flammable interface areas, a whole host of inspections. So it really needs to, I think, continue to address, you know, tie together directing property owners to maintain their properties in um, 
compliance with fire inspection standards. But, I like that language. I think it's an essential component. But, Tim, and you're also, and I, I was confused by what you just said, not all of it, you are supporting annual inspections. Well, we, are, we will probably continue to do that. I think it's a good idea. Whether or not you want to memorialize it in the general plan or utilize some other methodology in doing that, such but, as as part of our annual budget process where we re, you know, identify what our goals are going to be and refund those positions. Um, I mean, we may decide that we want to go to biannual inspections. We may decide yeah. that we want to, you know, um, cement everything out there and never do inspections again. I mean, uh, you, whether you want it in the general plan or whether you want it as part of your policy directions to the staff, Don't you decide the vehicle you want that in. Well, I'm saying well, yes. well, 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 well I'd like to finish this. Um, uh, uh, under S6.10, um, it doesn't have an annual in there, but it does require property property owners to conduct regular maintenance. Are you in support of regular? Absolutely. Okay, so then it just gets back to an inspection. That's all we're talking about here, then. So, so you and, reckon? And I think in, that in, was the only part annual. that the planning commission yeah, really I think wanted to leave. merge the two sentences together somehow to yeah, still maintain reference to urban wildland interface areas, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. And take particularly in a general plan document, the reference to maintaining properties in compliance with current fire inspection standards. Uh, those are the two things I think are essential from an enforcement standpoint. Okay, but you don't necessarily support under 6.8 annual inspections, and I guess that's just a manpower thing. Would it be annual a, or regular? A, a, would regular, a regular inspections could be fine, would that be a good way to put to it. Adjust it in the future. You know, okay, the issue then. is really, I mean, I support it because we actually do buy, you know, I mean, semi-annual inspections currently. So, but we may decide that someday in the future we only need to do every other year inspections because people are so incredibly yeah. talented and, yeah. and cooperative and, and uh, right. so, you know, you can decide that portion as far as I'm concerned. So okay. if you, do, you would drop out annual and possibly the words if necessary, right? So, uh, yep, I'd say regu conduct regular inspections of parcels and direct property owners bring property in compliance with fire inspection standards. Okay. And direct the property. Sure. Pro sure. Or require property owners, either word is fine. Well, I, I know, just was saying. I think they're synonymous from my perspective. Okay. Okay. Direct is that positive word that you like. Yeah. Are we are we putting tin back in or leaving it out? Is that what the, where we don't need it? Okay. I I think we need to go forward then. Okay. With uh, the changes to yeah. eight, ten is out. The same. Ten is out. Right. Ten, ten. Are you satisfied? Ten's okay to be out. Yeah. I think it's all handled in eight. Okay. Then that's fine. Any other comments? All right, good. You have direction? Yes. Okay. Okay, the next uh, section addresses hazardous materials. Um, and, of course, the fire department has a major role in this particular uh, topic as, as well. The um, only real change that was made in this area on, on 7.2, the GPAC, rather than citing a specific section of the municipal code, decided to incorporate language that refers back to the municipal code in, in, in general. <clears throat> they also uh, added there was concern about landfills that may not be designated today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis methane and the control then of the methane gas that is in those locations. So we don't have the exact wording, but I can talk to you about a theme. The, the uh, commission had suggested adding a policy that said something to the effect of consider the appropriateness of other methane districts such as landfills or to, the addition of those to the district's classification because there are specific controls under the municipal code about methane venting and et cetera lead off in those areas. So those were the uh, changes to the uh, text that were suggested by the commission. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Woody. I, I just didn't understand your comment. Could you do that in five words or less? They just they want wanted to refer that back policy to, to say consider uh, the appropriateness of other areas being incorporated in within the methane district, such as landfills. Was that, that was due to the fact that they specifically called out the one at 21st Street? Isn't that the, that's what a I actually, noticed? Actually, actually, it came from a 
comment from a member of the public with regard to Coyote Canyon. Well, I agree with the comment. I'm just questioning. I thought that wasn't there was something in here that actually referred to the uh, uh, landfill at 21st Street? No. Okay, I'm, I must have misread something. Okay. What's the council split? Ms. Selich? Do you have any comment? No, I'm fine with the uh, Planning Commission recommendation on it. Drozanski? Uh, I'm fine, except I don't think 7 2 is grammatically correct, so I hope you're going to clean that up. That doesn't really make sense. Yes. Yes, yes you're right. Okay. He designed to be or something. I'm not sure we need to add the. I'm not sure we need to add the wording in about other methane areas. I think that that our uh, if we find methane, it ends up being a methane area, and we end up handling it. Yeah, and Coyote Canyon is not an other methane area. I mean, there's <laughs> a methane gas generation plant up there. So, uh, you know, that's it's, what I'm saying. It's well defined. So I agree with Mr. Webb. We don't need that language in there. It's just you want to, yeah, you want to straighten it out. So you're yeah. considering that. It's just redundant. Okay. Okay. Let's okay. aviation. You have direction. Okay. Good. Thanks. Next is aviation hazards. Um, the um, Planning Commission accepted the um, changes uh, suggested by the GPAC in deleting S4, eight four, excuse me, and eight five. Uh, again, partially that some of these belong in the disaster planning section, and secondarily that these were all also, especially S eight point five, probably more detailed than you need to have in your general plan. On the last policy, there was a question about the opposition uh, to uh, facility expansions that would increase uh, air operations, uh, except those described in the settlement agreement. The, the concern of the commission was whether that gives the city enough flexibility to negotiate with the airport uh, over, over time, uh, particularly in connection to any changes of flights or passenger limits or curfew hours, et cetera, recognizing that during the life of this general plan, this current agreements will uh, sunset, et cetera. And so the commission did it come to precise language in here. They wanted the notion of some flexibility, and basically they provided direction to the attorneys to work on some language that would provide that flexibility with the city to negotiate with John Wayne Airport about the, 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 the concern was the actual way this is worded in terms of outright opposition, except for they were trying to find some other exceptions and you know, to broaden those exceptions to give you a little bit of flexibility. So they basically defaulted to the city attorney. And did the city attorney come up with any language? <laughs> no, because this just happened this afternoon. Okay. And I just, Mer I just I, found out about it. If I could comment on that one. <laughs> I yeah. mean, th this is aviation hazards, and we're talking about opposing any facility expansions that isn't necessarily directly tied to a hazard. It sounds like That's that is point. a council policy. Council already has a policy regarding John Wayne Airport and what the city's... Uh, well, we, we do address um, John Wayne Airport and, and the potential for expansion in our existing land use element. So it may be that, that this policy, because it isn't really hazard related, might be better in the land use element and that would give us time to work on the language before we come back to you in November. Sounds like a great idea. Well, yeah, I move forward to leaving out policy S8 because it's going to be placed elsewhere. Right. Perhaps. <laughs> what happened to S4 and S5? Flexibility. They were deleted and put in the end in the final policy for disaster preparedness. It's a council policy. They're, they're, they're not deleted. They're, re they're placed in disaster preparedness, Ed. All of the policies with regard to preparing, maintaining, updating, exercising the disaster plan um, and public education and notification go into S9 disaster planning. We don't show that in our document yet, right? No. Yeah. That was the recommendation of the commission. 
I was just concerned that Promontory Bay was left out. Just kidding. Hey, Mr. Mayor, oh, if I may, I uh, if that's going to be the direction of this document is to move <laughs> that specificity either into that or actually rely on other documents to provide it, then I'd recommend we probably do the same with policy S81, which talks about designating stage and areas or rendezvous points. That's really detail that's found buried in the current, you know, uh, Orange County Master Mutual Aid Marine Air Sea Disaster Plan that's already existing in another plan. It's always uh, subject to modification through continual updates and training. And so it probably doesn't need to be in here as a specific uh, policy. Okay. Council agree with that? Agree. Disaster plan. Councilman Daigle? Uh, is this goal new? Impacts to residents, property, and the environment from aviation related hazards will be minimized? I guess my concern is you could argue that an aviation hazard is an airplane crash, right. and therefore to limit that impact, you simply prohibit housing in wide sections of the city. Like half of it? Yeah. I, I don't feel comfortable with that goal as written. The um, existing public safety element, which dates to 1975, does not address aviation hazards at all. State law requires us to so there's been a change in the law. Now we do have to have a component of a, of a general plan adopted yeah. Yeah. current in current times. Okay. Is this something maybe they can come back later? Do we have to make a decision this evening? Well, if you can give us some general direction, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we should leave in 8-8 then because that gives general direction that we oppose any growth in the airport. And the other one says that uh, these are trying to obey their other policy, and if they conflict, then neither wins. Uh, th th this is a safety document. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with Mr. Blue Dow. 88 does not belong here. It, it really doesn't address safety. And as to the goal, uh, as suggested by Councilmember Dago, uh, it just said hazards will be minimized. It uh, doesn't say uh, totally uh, preventable. It just says minimized, and so there's always going to be something under a flight path, and flight paths change from day to day. So all you can do at this point in time is minim minimize, but not actually prevent uh, the hazards. The hazards do exist. I mean, hazards exist if you're walking down the street and there's a plane going overhead. I, 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 I mean, the goal is fine as written. Yeah, exactly. Does so you have any input on this? That you're right over the uh, landing gear office. <laughs> well, I think I think we ought to focus on the uh, on the safety issues and put the other issues, you know, somewhere else. Particularly S um, S eight. Just one more thought on that, and that is their um, settlement agreement uh, runs out in January 1st of 2016. If you have a general plan policy, I mean, there may be you want to give some wiggle room, you know, 10 years from now as, as to how you approach that settlement agreement, and somebody's going to hold it against you here if it is a general plan policy. Yeah. I, I guess well, I, by I, that time, we're going to uh, be amending the general plan anyway through, through an update. Right, every 10 years. Every right. 10 I think if we take long enough, we will. Aren't we? <laughs> no. Or am I deluding myself? We start right after it's adopted. I, I suppose I don't see goal S8 as, as abstract as what others may say, that you know it really pertains to a bolt coming out of the sky. I mean, I see it kind of applied in a way to, to minimize housing, and that's my concern. S8? Goal S8. Well, I know we're not going to build housing in the middle of Back Bay. <laughs> Although we're considering it within the 65 CNEL. <laughs> yeah. That's different than under the flight path. Okay. Well, yeah. well how, how do you deal with it? I mean, you, you the the, we, we have a, we have a an active issue. airport with I don't know how many takeoffs and landing that flies right over the, our city. How do you deal with that and, and make it jive with goal S8? There, there's a general description of the aviation hazards earlier on. 
in this policy, which talks about it. And basically, I think what I get out of reading that is the goal is to take steps to minimize and not um, have the increase of too much air traffic directly overhead. Not, not from a noise point of view or not from a land use planning point of view, but just as a safety point of view, that you would minimize the hazards by taking steps to minimize the number of planes that are taking off and landing at the airport. That is not necessarily what that one says, because when you talk about increase in air operations, that could be passengers and not flights. Right, and that's not necessarily related to safety. So what I think that maybe we could go back and, and again, um, look at this language and come back with something that deals directly with safety issues as it relates to these goals and policies. Okay, if you come back with something that relates to safety, then perhaps it's okay, but we still probably need to put this elsewhere in our plan, like that you would suggested be in the earlier. Plan. So where we're not totally throwing this away, we're just saying that right. it's not appropriate to be under aviation hazards. Right, and I agree that S-8 isn't appropriate because it doesn't necessarily relate to safety issues. So what we need to do is come up with a goal that describes something that would um, relate to the safety element issues and not to the land use planning issues. The final policy. The policy and the goal. Because Council Member Daigle has an issue with the goal itself as being potential for interpreting it as being more broader range than just a safety issue. Right, and, and I think that's why it fits in the land use plan or, or one of the other areas. Yeah. We're not following each other. She's talking about the goal. You're talking about 8-8. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I see what you mean. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's just, uh, we can bring it back, but I, I, I think we need to move on. I, again, I think the goal is fine. I think 8-8, uh, everybody has agreed except for Mr. Nichols. It should be removed. So, um, and 8 and, I mean, 4 and 5 should be put in the uh, disaster preparedness. And Mr. Uh, uh, or the chief suggested that there's uh, too much language in 8-1, so I guess you need to bring this whole thing back at a later time. Well, we will be bringing the, the entire okay, thing back great. because this then, is just your preliminary review. Because we've already, we're surpassing the Planning Commission right now in time. Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. okay. I, I just have one, one additional question on this. Um, What's the definition of hazard? Is it plane crashes or is it stuff that falls off the planes and plane crashes? Or um, the, in the, in the, um, in the um, initial, in the initial discussion, it's mostly plane crashes. Okay, thanks. And, and it recognizes the patterns for and the, and the current um, procedures and policies with regard to the airport um, protections against hazards of planes landing on houses. But there, it also recognizes the potential impacts, even if, it land, even if a plane was to fall and land in the bay, or um, the impacts to the environment, the impacts to boating, people in the bay, and that sort of thing. So there's other issues besides the hazards of just on residential properties. Let's move forward. Okay, can we go to the next? Okay, the last section. This is the section we've been talking about um, fairly lengthily about the fact that there are going to be a number of sections the policies move from the other topics into this and they'll be treated comprehensively. This is the emergency response section. Uh, the recommendations besides the, the items that we had talked about moving before <clears throat> by the Planning Commission was a first relative to the goal at the very end to change and add some language. And let me read it. it uh, effective emergency response to natural or human-induced disasters that minimizes the loss of life and damage to property while also reducing disruptions in the delivery of vital public and private services during and following a disaster, this is where they added language, will continue to be developed and implemented. And that was the notion that it's just not implementation of existing uh, strategies or procedures, but you need to continually upgrade and develop those as well. That was the first change in the section the commission recommended. Secondarily, on um, policy, the last policy, which is 9.6 or strikeout 5, 
the um, commission uh, added the word after, well, I'll read it, sponsor and support education programs pertaining to emergency disaster preparedness, and then insert the word evacuation and response protocols and procedures. And then on the distribution, the second sentence, they added specifically because it now addresses community groups, schools, religious in institutions, and business. They also wanted to add the word residents. So there's actually a communication program back not to just groups and organizations, but to individuals who are residents as well. Those are the changes that uh, were made by the commission. Okay, who wants to weigh in first? Sounds good to me. Let's go. Okay, that's a good. That's a good. Agree. Good to go. Okay, you want to weigh in on this? Well, the all all of the policies will come back when we're in public hearing for the the council to to take your final action on it. We will be preparing. Um, a strikeout underline to show all the, the changes that you made in distributing that to you so you can see that we have followed your direction. Okay. Any other council comment? Okay. Uh, open up to public comment. No one's here. Close it. Okay. Uh, public comment on agenda items. Seeing none, I'll close that. City Clerk, what's the formal way of adjourning this meeting? Um, first motion for reconsideration, a motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made by only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any uh, motions for reconsideration? Okay, I'm seeing, seeing none. Okay, then we will be adjourned. Thank you.